start the recording. Please. OK, that's us. OK, thank you, uh, Lindsay. Welcome to those in attendance to the remote meeting of the Planning Development Management Committee on Thursday, the 10th of December 2020, the last meeting of the year for planning anyway. So welcome everybody and uh, thank you for your festive touch this as always Councillor Allen. Um, please note that the meeting will be recorded and published online for public access of the meeting. Can all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphone when not speaking? The camera and microphone should only be switched on when you're invited to speak. As the uh, Planning Development Management Committee contains quasi judicial business, members are reminded that they should not leave the room or the meeting during the consideration of any application. If they're required to leave the meeting, please advise the clerk by the meeting room chat. Any members not in attendance for the full deliberation of an application will be unable to vote. Um, if I could add, now ask the clerk to undertake a roll call of the members participating today and for all members to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced by the clerk so that it's clear for the recording and the record of the meeting. Thank you. Can I pass over to Mr. Bain? Yeah, thank you, convener. So I'll just shout out your name. Just please state that you're present. So convener. Present. Councillor Stewart. I'm present. Councillor Allen. Present. Councillor Cook. Present. Councillor Radley is substitute for Councillor Copeland. Present. Councillor Cormie. Present. Councillor Gregg. Present. Councillor Mackenzie. Present. And Councillor Malik. Present. OK, that's everyone here. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, um, Ms McBean. Uh, welcome, Councillor Radley. Um, I believe this is one of your first meetings uh, since joining Aberdeen City Council, so hopefully you'll find it um, informative and enjoyable. Um, so moving on to the agenda. So motions against officers' recommendation at 1.1. We've all got that procedural note. And we indicate if they don't, or otherwise I will take it as confirmed. Uh, there's no determination of urgent business at 3.1. Any declarations of interest? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, marvellous. Okay, the minutes of the previous meeting, which I'm sure you'll all recall, um, at 4.1 are on pages 9 to 20. I won't go through each individual page, but we contend that's an accurate record of the meeting. Contend. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, at 5.1, we have the committee planner on pages 21 to 24. Um, Mr. Lewis, could I just ask you, at September's meeting, we agreed to have a predetermination hearing for Binghill House. Are we any further forward with arranging a date? Uh, just as an update on that, uh, Councillor, we've received further information related to that site, which we'll have to re-notify on. Uh, so once that process is over, we can then try and arrange a hearing as soon as possible after that. It'll be February, March time now, probably at the earliest. OK, hopefully we'll all have had our jags and we'll be back in the, the townhouse. OK, thank you very much, Mr Lewis. OK, moving on to the general business. So first, with the recommendation is one of approval. At 6.1, we have detailed planning permission for the formation of access uh, and access road and associated works at Tilly Drone Nursery, Bill Road, Aberdeen. It's on page 25 to 46. Planning reference 201125 and the planning officer is Ms. Green. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just share my presentation. Thank you. While you're loading that up on the screen, we obviously got further comments from the community council at Tilly Drones, and uh, uh, if you could obviously address that, because I know it's been forwarded to you. Thank you. Yes, I, I will be addressing that. Um, can you see my presentation now? Can, yeah, thank you. OK, um, so this is an application for detailed planning permission for the formation of the access road at Tillydrone, Tillydrone Nursery. Um, and just to note is that the nursery, including the car park and an alternative access from Dill Road to the west, were approved under delegated powers at the beginning of the year. So that's the location plan that you should be looking at now. Um, the site's located to the north of Riverbank Primary. That's within the blue line here. 
um, and it's currently under development for the nursery, which already has planning permission. To the west is the Energy Centre and the Lads Club, with the Lads Club car park, which is referred to in some of the papers. Also to the west is the Riverbank Service Access Road, which under the nursery permission was to be upgraded as the car park access. So that was this route in, which would have come into the car park through here. Um, to the east of the site is Gort Road, with its parking lay-by adjacent to the site just here. And Gort Road to the north does not link through to Gordon Mills Road at the top there. It links through at this point. Um, whilst there's a further link um, from Gort, Gort Road through to Hayton Road. So I'll just move on to the overhead photograph of the site um, and we can see the site as a grassed area when this photograph was taken and the road would be coming through from the end of the parking lay-by just here. I'm just going to jump a slide for, for now um, and show you the site as proposed. Um, so this shows the access road proposed under the current application coming in from the east here, um, whilst the car park and turning area would remain as they are on the permission that's been granted. Um, and the proposal also involves the removal of the end of the parking bay with two spaces lost there and further spaces would be lost as a result of the parking restrictions. So I'll just go back to the slide before now and that's just shows the parking restrictions that would be introduced. So the two bays lost would be here. Parking restrictions would be introduced. So just moving on to the landscaping plan. Um, this plan, although the, there's a condition um, recommended covering landscaping, but this plan shows us um, a community seating area. Um, which is similar, although in a slightly different location to what was approved on the nursery application. So this shows the approved scheme um, with the access coming in from Dill Road. I'm just sweeping around there. And then this area was left as open space. And that's the approved scheme for landscaping. So the next three slides are just looking uh, taken from Street View, just um, looking north up Gort Road to start with. So the nursery sites here on the left. And the next one looking straight across. So this path um, through would be straightened out and would come out at this point the nursery sites here. And that's the end of the parking bay where the two spaces would be removed. And then that's looking south down Gort Road so the parking lay by on the right here and Riverbank Playground. OK, so turning to the consultations on the application. Um, First of all, there was the roads team who note the parking survey results and consider the loss of the spaces to be acceptable. Um, that confirm that there's sufficient space for turning of a refuse vehicle and following further consideration, it's recommended that an additional condition be attached to the application um, requiring the footway along the access road to be at least two metres in width and for a scheme for that to be submitted. Moving on now to the Community Council response to the consultation. Um, this was unfortunately not included in the report because it was received after the report was finalised. So I'll summarise the objection and this is an additional slide which covers that summary. Um, Many of the issues raised go beyond the scope of the current application, but raise issues that um, 
the community council feel relevant in the area. Um, so they raise road safety for pedestrians and in particular for children around the site. The loss of the residential parking and the existing problem that they feel with parking near home. Um, the loss of green space. Pollution due to the increased traffic. Um, they refer to the previous application for the extension at the Riverbank School where um, access for pedestrians was segregated from the car park access. Then, and then there's various reports and correspondence that are also referred to. These relate mainly to unsafe parking and lack of parking. Um, there's comments about the nursery application and the consultation by the planning authority. I'll pick up all these points later in the when I cover the evaluation. Um, there's a question about the nursery catchment and the capacity of the nursery. Whether the nursery would be private or not. Um, there's some comment on the condition on the nursery application covering the passing place and also drainage. Um, they refer to the parking survey and queried the hours that were included in it. They talk about the footpath width, that's the footpath along the side, the access road going to the nursery. Um, there's comments about St Peter's Roman Catholic School moving to Riverbank. Um, there are comments about the accident record within the area, referring to children, cyclists and vehicle damage. There's some discussion about the removal of bollards on Gort Road. That's just to the southern end of the parking bay. And there are a number of questions at the end of the response about non-vehicular access, opening hours, deliveries, the reason for the application and the operation of the nursery. So I'll pick up the answers to those in a moment. Just leave that up. Um, so turning to the consideration of the application, the main policies for consideration were those relating to residential areas and green space, and these cover the issues of residential amenity and loss of green space. Um, so in considering the application, it was important to bear in mind that the nursery already had permission with access to the car park from the west. So the car park remains the same and is for staff with one disabled space. Parents and carers would under the permission, current permission and under this application, will be dropping off on foot or by car from various locations within the surrounding area. So this was taken into account in the report's recommendation that the impact on residential amenity is acceptable. In terms of green space, a similar area would be provided to that proposed under the nursery application. And although it's separated from the nursery by the access road, there is an existing footpath on the south side of the green space and the community seating area would be included, which would be similar to the nursery permission. In terms of road traffic, there would be parking restrictions around the new junction. The traffic survey showed adequate parking at various times of day, which would allow for a reduction of the five spaces. And there's a condition on the nursery application requiring a travel plan to encourage walking and cycling. The nursery is also centrally, lo centrally located within the residential area. So just covering those questions from the Teledrone Community Council. Um, as, although it's not relevant really to the consideration of this application, the consultation on the nursery application was carried out via the usual route of an email with a link to the weekly list, um, an email to the community council, and it did go out to the email address on our records at that time. Um, the capacity of the nursery is stated by the applicant as 56, and it's not proposed to be privately run. The applicant states that children will arrive and depart at various times within the opening hours. There will be one footpath along the access road um, and there are other pedestrian routes to the nursery from other directions. As I mentioned earlier, the footway would be widened to at least two metres by condition. In terms of deliveries, there's quite a wide pedestrian entrance area so that it's considered by the roads team that even if deliveries were taking place when children were arriving, there was no conflict envisaged there. Um, 
they raise safer routes to school and um, Scott Lynch may add more to this, but it's noted that parents would be accompanying nursery children and that the nursery is located next to the um, existing Riverbank School. So there's um, the, the question about the reason for the change in access is really for the applicant and uh, included quotes from their supporting statement in the report with the reasons being given as to keep the nursery separate from Riverbank School and also for cost reasons. So to conclude, the application is recommended for approval with conditions relating to landscaping, surface water drainage and the increased width of the footway. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Um, um, can I ask can questions, questions, members? members? I'm not seeing any hands. Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I just really wanted a bit more clarity about taking the children to school. Um, I mean, you can't enforce people walking, and we know how difficult that can be, especially with a few children in hand. So, looking for a bit more detail. Um, if it is appropriate at this stage about the walking plan, um, how many cars would be able to drop off children? Um, I know this is an issue through all schools, but if we're, you know, if we're about to make proposals for something, we should have that more clear in our mind. And also with the proposals, um, you know, my ears uh, definitely perked up when I heard about St. Uh, St. Peter's and going to River Bank. So uh, is that possible. Okay. I think um, Mr. do you want me to pass it to Mr. Lynch on um, the screen or would you like to have a stab? Um, I can co comment on a couple of those points. St. Peter's is the plan is to move into Riverbank. I mean that's an existing um, proposal so we can't really take into account the traffic from that because that's going to happen any you know if that happens it's going to happen anyway sort of. Thing. Yeah. Um, the travel plan is a condition on the nursery application. So, um, and it, it, it covers, you know, people walking from all around the nursery. It's not, the car park is really for staff. So whether this application will change where people park in the surrounding area, I think that's, you know, that's questionable because they could still park on Gort Road and walk along the footpath, even with the, permission that we have granted. Can, may I come back, convener, on Certainly. that, please? So ju just um, in terms of parking on Gork Road, as you say, would that cause problems if they did do that? And, you know, could it be a whole load of people arriving all at the same time? And, and, and to be honest, with you, I'm not even talking about the, the, the this period that we're living in and all the rest of it. I'm just sort of I'm moving way beyond that. I mean, just when we get back to normality in terms of parents dropping little children and little children can't walk far, nurse at age three, about three years, I think, to five. And my experience is three-year-olds, little legs won't walk that far. I just wondered, you know, whether it would cause congestion if there was lots of vehicles, because I imagine the class will be about 20 in a nursery class. There'll be a few classes. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll maybe hand over to others, but I suppose yeah. my main point is that that situation won't be any different to the nursery that already has permission because they could, under the current permission that they have, they could park on Gort Road and walk into nursery or park on other roads and walk into nursery but I'll hand over to to others for more on that. Um, I think Maria T's had her hand oh, up. Maria. Thank you convener Um, I just thought it might be helpful just to maybe discuss the other provision in Tilly Drone and um, a big part of the ELC expansion program is about providing local provision and embedding that into the community um, so this site obviously will um, provide 56 place nursery, but we'll also have provision at the current Riverbank School. 
There's also um, provision in the new rep bank replacement school for 100 children. So that's just within the local co context of Tilly Drone. Um, there will obviously be provision in the adjacent areas. So obviously Greenbrae, um, you know, Bridget Dawn, et cetera. So the, really the focus is whilst people can choose where they actually go for the provision in the future, um, there will be sufficient capacity within Tilly Drone, which would hopefully encourage people to use sustainable routes like walking their children to school and the travel plans that will be in place. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. OK, uh, Mr Lynch, do you want to add anything to um, Councillor Stewart's question in terms of any sort of congestion and traffic problem on Groat Road? Yeah, sure. Thank you, convener. Um, I suppose to reiterate firstly what Lucy had said was that obviously this application is just for the change of access for the staff parking area. So the, the first point I would make is um, that that shouldn't have any effect on where people park. But that aside, our parking standards don't allow for a provision for um, parents parking. So I think it just is the nature of these sorts of applications when you retrofit them into existing areas that people are just going to have to find somewhere parked to take their kids to school. And in terms of the effect that will have, it, it's very difficult to predict because we don't know where people are going to park. But then should there be an issue, that's when it would then get past the traffic management team who would sort of seek to address those measures after the fact. So at, at this moment in time, it's hard to predict what effect it will have, but it's certainly something we can deal with anyway, if that answers your question. Okay, okay. thank, thank you. you. Uh, um, I've got Councillor Cook and Councillor Gray. Councillor Cook. Thanks, Convener. Yeah, it's just a relatively minor point, actually. The On pages 41 to 42 of the pack, um, there is a supporting statement from Children and Protective Services, who, if I'm reading it correctly, are basically saying you can either go in through the original access point, which is going through the, the, the school, or you can come in from Gort Road. And Children and Protective Services are saying coming in from Gort Road is a safer option than going through the school. Presumably the roads team would, would agree with that because it seems to make common sense. Mr Lynch. Um, uh, yeah, the only reason I would imagine that it would be safer coming in from Gort Road is because I th if I remember looking at the plan, coming through the existing school involves walking across a turning area. Is that right, Lucy? And if so, I'd imagine that's the reason that they would uh, perceive it as being safer because the Gort Road entrance would be a footway the whole way. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of ways in from the other side. You could come through the Lads Club car park, which is um, a footway most of the way through that car park um, or through the Riverbank School. But yeah, Gort Road is a would be a wider footpath route. Sorry, I was actually thinking more in terms of, of cars going into the staff car park. Oh, sorry, um, I don't. Th I, I don't think there's a way or do you just mean compared to the old application sorry sorry in that case sorry i've misread the misread the report then sorry <laughs> that's that's okay okay um councillor craig that thank you um Various representations within the report mention road safety incidents. For example, page 39, um, there's mention of um, someone being knocked over. I, I wondered if the if the if the record of incidents has been looked at. Are there particular vulnerabilities um, in the in the network of roads around this site that need to be taken into account? Um, and is, is, is there any any mitigation that can be put into place to protect pedestrians? Thanks. Um, well, I did um, ask for <laughs> police record of accidents and there weren't. You've frozen, Mrs. Green. In the last. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lucy's frozen. Um, Scott, could you pick that up while we unfreeze Miss screen? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Convener. Um, I can't remember the period of time, if I recall, I think it was three years, but there was no recorded accident. So I, I think uh, 
Lucy had mentioned that there was an anecdotal accident somebody had written in about, but yeah, there was no record of that officially anywhere. So yeah, there was, wasn't any more we could look into that because there was nothing for us to go on, unfortunately. So as far as the record shows, there are no cases of accidents in that area. Okay. Um, could I please ask a follow-up question? Of course, um, um, the this this area, this um, this access route is for staff and as a turning area. So, is there any way of indicating the the volume of traffic that would use that would be accessing and exiting that site during the day? Would you consider it to be light, a light flow of traffic, or medium, or what? Just to get an indication of the of the volume of traffic movement, if that's sure. possible. I, I suppose that to give you the most accurate answer, it would just be going by the number of spaces. That's how many staff you could at most expect to park in there. And that would be over the course of an hour or two in the morning and evening when they leave. So I'd say it'd be very lightly trafficked. And in terms of deliveries, that's probably one for uh, Lucy, but I wouldn't imagine there would be many a day. So I'd say it's very lightly trafficked. Okay, thank you. Are you with us, Lucy? Yes, yeah, sorry, I did get thrown out then. <laughs> That's okay, no problem. Um, yeah, I mean, the turning area is really just for the refuse lorry. It's not envisaged that parents would go in there to turn and drop off children. It's um, So the, the car park would just be for staff um, and, and the disabled space. Okay. Is that Sister Councillor Greg? Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just double check? There's no other questions. I just have to flick through your names to make sure nobody's got their hand up. I don't see any more. Okay. We have um, a recommendation of approval conditionally. The conditions are set out on page 45. There was two conditions. We've heard of the, a third one for the extra width for the, the footway. Um, and there's one advisory note. Um, we've heard obviously from Mrs Green that there is already a planning permission in place and this is obviously an adaption to it. Um, are, can, are members happy to approve the recommendations with that additional con condition? We agreed? Agreed. Okay, okay. I think again for completeness, just so that we've got... Yeah, I'll, I'll get Ms McBain to come in and just run through everybody. Thank you, convener. We'll just do a quick recall to make sure everybody's in agreement. So just um, say if you're happy to approve the recommendation with the conditions. So Councillor Bolton? Agreed. Councillor Stewart? Ag agreed. Councillor Allen? Agreed. Councillor Cook? Agreed. Councillor Radley? Agreed. Councillor Cormie? Agreed. Councillor Greg? Approve. Councillor McKenzie. Agreed. <coughs> Sorry, agreed. Sorry, Councillor Malik. Agreed. Okay, so that's thank you. Thank you. Members, moving on to detailed planning permission for a residential development of 167 dwellings with associated car parking, open spaces, and associated infrastructure at land east of Polk. Auckland Avenue Cove, that's on page 47 to 100, planning reference 200584, and we have the planning officer, Mr Gavin Evans, in attendance. Mr Evans. Uh, again, I'll just get the presentation up on screen here. Thank you. <clears throat> again, members, I know that there's been some representation sent to you, but I'm sure Mr Evans will cover anything additional that comes his way. Can do, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you, convener. Um, item 6.2 before us today uh, is an application for detailed planning permission for residential development of 167 dwellings with associated car parking, open space and infrastructure on land to the east of Falkland Avenue Cove. Uh, the report for this item is at pages 65 to 99 of the agenda pack, and this presentation is at pages 47 to 63. So just starting off the location plan, um, this application concerns a site of roughly three hectares, which forms part of a wider opportunity site identified in the local development plan. That's OP58 at Station Fields Cove. Um, got an aerial view next. 
so the site's bounded by the Coast Road and Falkland Avenue to the west, um, and by the Aberdeen to Dundee, Dundee railway line to the east. Um, the site, which slopes down to the east towards the railway line and the coast, is currently unused grassland and there are no trees present within the site boundary. Uh, the site's been identified for housing in successive local plans and local development plans since 2008, with its current OP designation referring to an opportunity for 150 homes to be tied to a new Cove master plan. Um, just got an image here. Um, so in recognition of the local development plans requirement for a master plan, a development framework has been prepared to accompany this application. This is just the front cover from that document. It gives a gives a good aerial view of the uh, of the site. Um, so that sets out a high level strategy for the development of the entire OP58 site, though it is noted that the remainder of, uh, of that site out with the, the current application site uh, is in different ownership. Um, uh, also provides an analysis of development density and site capacity. Um, a detailed design and access statement has also been prepared for the application site specifically, rather than the wider site, setting out key design principles, including scale, massing and materials. I've just got a few images that are taken from the uh, design and access statement and develop, development framework documents here. Um, firstly, as a view from the southwest corner of the site, looking north up Falkland Avenue and across the site, which is just on the right hand side of the image. Uh, the lower image, um, the text there isn't correct. That's not lo not looking along Langdykes Road. It's looking up the coast road, uh, which becomes Lorston Road and Lorston Avenue um, to the west of the site. Uh, next slide, um, we have looking from the coast road southeast across the application site. Uh, you note the location of the existing East Lynn property, which sits around about the midpoint of uh, of the OP58 site. Um, and the lower image there is looking at the site from out with uh, from other land within OP58 on the other side of that East Lynn property. Uh, top left image here is the image, uh, the view of the site just from the train. Um, we've also got the coastal path information panel and signage, uh, an aerial view to the bottom left, and uh, just an indication of the core path route where it runs underneath the railway line. <clears throat> uh, in this next slide, we have uh, again, core path signage. Uh, you may know the core path itself lies out with the application site, but there are connections provided through the, uh, the internal layout to allow for for that to remain as a sort of recreational route. Um, and the last image there is just looking up the coast road um, to the west of the site. So next slide here shows some surrounding context. Uh, it shows the wider OP58 boundary outlined in yellow there with the site in red. So you'll see it's uh, approximately a third of the site area that we're talking about today. Um, also on there are bus stops in pink, the conservation area boundary for Cove, um, which is sort of shaded in blue um, just to the to the east and south of the site. Uh, core path routes, which are the sort of darker blue lines. So again, you'll see that the core path route runs through the application, or sorry, through the wider OP58 site at its midpoint uh, before going under the railway line and connecting up with the coastal path. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, these are just extracts from the Aberdeen Local Development Plan. So there's constraints uh, from the constraints plan on the left showing again the core path routes, uh, undeveloped coastline in light blue and the Cove Conservation Area boundary which is in orange. On the right hand side uh, this slide just shows, uh, this image sorry, just shows the zoning. Um, so this site and the wider OP58 are both zoned as part of an H1 residential area where the principle of residential development is acceptable subject to a series of criteria outlined in that policy H1. Um, green space network shown in the sort of polka dot green, uh, a, a slice of which runs through that central part of the site where the core path's located. <clears throat> um, this is an image from the development framework, uh, just showing the framework areas. Uh, so the site's split into three areas based on an envisaged phased development. Uh, you'll note they're not all within single ownership and the current application concerns Zone A, um, the southern portion of the, the full OP58 site. Um, next slide is, oh, sorry, 
the cheap trigger finger. Um, this is the proposed site layout. Um, so the, the overall development proposes uh, 45 houses and 122 flats, which are uh, the flats being provided across six separate blocks of between 12 and 24 units each. Uh, units range from one bedroom to four bedroom with a good mix of unit types and sizes following revisions uh, based on feedback from the council's housing strategy team. Um, buildings are of up to four storeys, but the scale and massing is offset significantly by the drop in ground levels from uh, west to east. So we're dropping, uh, the site's dropping effectively down towards the railway line. So the flatted blocks which are higher are on the lowest part of the site, which uh, mitigates their, um, their increased visual impact. Um, you'll note that the uh, access road is routed through the site, if you can just follow my cursor there, connecting up the two, uh, two site accesses that are formed to the west. Uh, houses are to the west of that access road with flatted blocks to the east. Um, the houses are generally two-storey terraced and semi-detached uh, semi properties, uh, utilising white dry dash render and grey roof tiles. Uh, with coloured sills or window surrounds to add a degree of visual interest. Uh, a, num a smaller number of houses are actually picked out in an orange render with orange pan tiles to add some variety to those street elevations, particularly, uh, for example, here where you know it's terminating a view at the end of a, a, an open space area. Uh, flatted blocks are also finished in um, predominantly dry dash render, uh, mostly white, um, but with feature areas picked out in colour. Uh, blue and orange have been shown indicatively on the plan, although uh, final details of the materials would be secured by condition in the event of approval. Uh, rainwater goods and windows are formed in UPVC. Um, this layout plan also includes car parking in line with adopted parking standards for affordable housing, uh, cycle parking, bin stores and motorcycle parking spaces. Uh, a suds basin is shown to the east of the plan, um, it's actually two, two suds basins just in a single location, uh, providing for surface water to be treated and released at a controlled rate from the site. Uh, moving on, there's some useful street elevations here uh, on the next few slides. The first one here uh, at 1-1, one, one, uh, it's facing east, uh, showing the site frontage onto Coast Road and Falkland Avenue. So that's the, the sort of public face to the site as you would currently see it. 2-2, uh, the lower image there is facing west and that's the view from the central swathe of open space towards the dwellings and again you can see what I mentioned before mostly units are, are in white render with occasional um, coloured flashes around windows and in gables um, and then there's there's a few properties picked out in orange with those orange pan tiles. Uh, here is facing east uh, showing flatted blocks A6, A3 and A2 going from left to right there and again, you'll see the, the predominantly white rendered finish, but with sort of entrances and corner features picked out in, uh, in coloured render. <clears throat> the lower image there is quite useful in uh, illustrating the drop in ground levels, uh, the fall from, uh, from west to east, and how the, the building heights increase to that portion of the site. But in, in overall terms, in terms of visual impact, um, there's no, no great change. Um, Onto the last slide, uh, or last street elevation anyway. Uh, this image is facing uh, facing north. Again, shows the uh, end of terraced rows and illustrates the change in ground levels and increase in building heights. Um, that increase in building heights down towards the lower part of the site and the railway line also uh, has the effect of attenuating sound from the railway um, and subject to mitigation in terms of uh, ventilation ventilation and uh, and window specification on the eastern side of that building towards the railway line and um, that would be sufficient to protect an entity of residence within. And um, lastly just finishing with a couple of sketch images from the development framework um, very much sort of indicative and just to just to give you an, an indication. Um, the first one here shows the view from Falkland Avenue through the central part of the site towards the sea. Uh, this is a pedestrian only access point, as you can see there, uh, with a footpath provided through the landscaped open space running west to east. The development framework refers to the use of coloured renders around windows in these 
gable ends as you can just see picked out there um, to add some interest and distinctiveness and sort of reflect the coastal location where uh, that use of colour is, is fairly well established in Scotland. Um, on this second slide, the images show the central open space to either side of that path. Um, this runs north to south and provides a safe place for spay. Uh, safe place for spay. I'll try that again with my teeth. In. <laughs> safe space for play, overlooked by properties and free from vehicle traffic. Uh, play equipment's also to be provided within that space. Uh, the detail of that's to be conditioned um, if members are minded to approve, but it's indicatively shown on the site layout plan. Um, in terms of other matters, the application is before members today because it represents a major application and so requires committee uh, determination in accordance with our scheme of delegation. In terms of consultations, uh, these are quite extensive and included in full within the report, but main issues um, are uh, there's an objection from the local Cove and Dalton's Community Council which has a particular focus on the number of units exceeding the opportunity site designation. Um, in the local development plan and uh, perceived conflict, conflict with aspirations for the delivery of a train station or halt at Cove. Um, it's come to our attention also that an archaeological consultation should have been undertaken uh, because this is a major application. Um, so that was done ahead of committee, um, but confirmed that uh, there was no archaeological interest or requirement for further investigation. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of public representation, um, I'll just put this back to the layout plan just while I'm talking to this. Um, there were 118 representations of which 115 stated objection to the proposal and three were neutral. Um, in terms of our recommendation, officers are recommending approval to members today subject to conditions and subject to a legal agreement specified in the report. Um, it's considered that the principle of residential use on this site is well established through successive local plans and local development plans. The proposal that's currently before the planning authority is for a number of units only marginally above that stated in the opportunity site designation, uh, that being 167 compared to the, the 150 in the opportunity site. Um, the submitted development framework and design and access statement demonstrate that this density of development can be satisfactorily accommodated within the application site without representing overdevelopment and without adversely affecting the character or amenity of the surrounding area. Whilst it is recognised that the remainder of the OP58 site may be subject to further applications for uh, additional development at a similar scale, that would be a matter for assessment in considering any such applications, along with the principle of further exceeding the OP site number which would be treated um, most likely as a departure from the development plan at that time and subject to associated processes. Um, the proposal before us incorporates a good mix of unit types and styles and the delivery of a 100% affordable housing development is welcome in terms of meeting identified needs and demand. The siting, massing and design of buildings is appropriate to its context and makes use of the sloping site to good effect um, to accommodate higher flatted blocks without significant visual impact, thereby making uh, more efficient use of the of the land available. Parking provision is made in line with the development plan and the site suitably accessible via existing public transport infrastructure. Uh, connections will be maintained to recreational routes, including the core path and potential noise issues relating to the railway can be addressed through the detailed design of the eastern face of flatted blocks, such that amenity can be safeguarded. Appropriate provisions made within the layout for open space, drainage, refuse and recycling. And overall, the proposal has been considered to demonstrate its compliance with the development plan and no material considerations, including the matters raised in representation, have been found to be of su sufficient weight to outweigh that compliance with the development plan. Um, so I'll just hand back to you at that point, convener, and I can take any questions from members. Thank you, Mr Evans. Uh, members, questions? Um, okay, um, Councillor Greg, got you, and then I'll take Councillor Greg. Great, Th thank you, convener. Um, I've, I've, I've got two questions. Um, the first one is about those six flatted blocks to the east. They're intended to act as an acoustic barrier um, for the whole site. Um, it would be helpful to get a little more explanation as to how that 
operate because um, it would it would be particularly useful to know how those blocks are themselves protected. Do they absorb noise or or repel noise? Just a little more detail would be appreciated. Yeah, of course. Um, well, effectively, the scale of those blocks is such that they can act as a barrier for the rest of the site and um, attenuate sounds and protecting amenity for the, um, the rows of terraces that lie beyond. In terms of amenity within the flatted blocks themselves, um, environmental health colleagues have advised that the specification or an enhanced specification for uh, glazing and ventilation um, should be capable of dealing with um, the noise coming from the railway line and ensure that those residents residing within these flatted blocks aren't any worse off as a result and um, you know noise levels uh, achieve the, the necessary thresholds. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, could I ask a second question, please? Of course you can, Councillor. Okay. Um, there is also a recommendation for secured by design accreditation. Um, and I, I had a look, I couldn't find that um, being recorded as a, as a condition or, or as advice or as an informative. Um, it would appear to be desirable and we've added it in previously to, to other applications. Um, would that not be um, a useful additional um, requirement. Yes, that's that's a, a good point, Councillor Greg. Um, generally, this isn't something that we condition, but we could make the applicant aware of it um, by way of an informative note. And uh, you're you're right, we have done that on other consents, so it would be reasonable to do that here as well. Okay. Thank you. All done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Greg. Councillor Radley. Thank you. Um, it was just a question um, about there's been some sort of some speculation that there would be opportunity for a station, a railway station on site. Um, I know the Community Council have raised that as an objection. Um, would there still be an opportunity for a station to be sited with this development as it is? Thank you, Councillor Radley. Um, yes, uh, potentially uh, there could still be um, an opportunity for uh, a railway halt or station to be accommodated within the remainder of the OP58 site. So this development wouldn't wouldn't totally preclude that possibility. I understand there is a there is a sort of study ongoing via Nestrans yeah. about about those possibilities. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Radley. Councillor Mackenzie. If this development goes ahead, would the local primary and secondary schools be able to cope with this? Uh, yes, Councillor Mackenzie, we've uh, consulted with um, the Council's education colleagues who've advised that the uh, schools which this is zoned for, sorry, I'm just checking my notes, uh, which are Lorston uh, Primary and Lockside Academy would both operate within capacity when this development and its pupil numbers are factored into school rule forecasts, so they're so satisfied that no uh, mitigation or uh, increased capacity is necessary as a result of this development. Okay, Councillor McKenzie. Yes, thank you. Okay, Councillor Cormie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, my questions around about the, obviously the gradient in, the, in this site is, is quite a uh, steep slope and I remember coming up before that the RDM team had also commented on the drainage impact uh, identified in earlier responses uh, and the RDM team have now been addressed to their satisfaction. Can you remind us what the, these questions were uh, regarding the drainage because uh, there is a hell of a gradient in that uh, site itself. Thank you. Um, I would maybe just ask my colleague, Mr. Lynch, to to maybe speak on behalf of the Roads Development Management team on that point. Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Um, I've actually just had to open my response and refresh my memory as to what I asked. It's been so long, but um, I had just queried their drainage impact assessment and their SUDS provisions, which adequately satisfied me. And then I consulted the flooding team who had also accepted the further documentation that had been submitted. So I had no further um, queries in that regard. From a roads point of view at this stage, we only look at SUDs and then when they would come in and submit their uh, 
road construction consent application, that's when we would start looking in detail. So, um, yeah, things haven't been looked at in massive detail, but we're certainly satisfied that an engineering solution is available. Councillor Corby, you. Um, yeah, that's helpful. But I, I'm just surprised that Network Real hasn't uh, commented on this at all. Thank you. That, 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 that's okay. Um, is there any other hands at the stage? No, I don't see anybody. Could I just ask a couple of questions? Um, <clears throat> back to the education, and uh, I don't know if it'll be yourself, Mr. Evans or Ms. Tierney. How far is the primary school from this development. Oh, um, it just it just showed a name on the, the map and it didn't really give me an indication exactly where it was and I couldn't picture it, but I know where some of them are, but I just couldn't quite picture how they got there. Yeah, um, I can share my screen again just because there was a slide here that did actually show that. I, I, I'm afraid I don't have the the distance to hand, but it might give an indication. Briefly. Uh, here we go. Hopefully, you can see that just momentarily. Could could I maybe come in there, convener? I've yeah, just please. M measured it there on on Google Earth, so um, it's about f um, 350 meters the, in terms of the site away from Lauriston Primary School. Oh, that's super. Thanks very much, Mr. Lee. Um, and I, I ask this is a road for a question for roads. Um, maybe. Mr. Evans, you could pick, uh, take up the photo of the kind of, if you like, the corner going down to the site. Um, okay. it's, again, uh, it's, it's just about the pedestrian safety, particularly at that point for children crossing. So I think that's where the path kind of comes so is it out. Is just at this point that you mean? Yeah, uh -huh. I'm just trying to work out where the path is in relation to that for the children getting up to school. Because it's obviously quite a difficult even there for uh, adults with the, with the kind of the the way the roads come together so maybe mr leach um can you maybe comment in terms of i know that we we said we that it's just the safe routes to school that i just want to be reassured about because there is a, you know a lot of family housing in there yes yeah, so was this a question for um mr lynch uh, yes, probably, I just wanted to use Mr. Evans to bring up some of the photographs. Um, it, it's just about the safe routes to school, Mr. Lynch, in terms of um, where the route, the paths come out or connections onto the, you know, like the, the pavements and uh, crossings. Thank you. Um, yeah, the safe route to school satisfied us that everything was adequate. There's also a drawing submitted that you can see in sort of the online package. It's the most up-to-date um, roads layout drawing, which shows where they're proposing tactiles, which are the points at which pedestrians would cross the road. Um, so they've shown that there's one beside the southern entrance and then one on the curve, I guess you'd call it, the bend in the road as well, which would provide adequate visibility to pedestrians crossing out from the site. Okay. And in terms of the width of the pavement, I mean, we obviously heard that in the, the previous application because just looking at these pavements, I mean, they look quite narrow from a photograph, but again, photographs can be deceiving. So again, if you've got kids or a fish chair and a child, you know, are you content that the pavements are actually wide enough to, to manage this? Thank you, Convener. Um, if I remember correctly, the pavements are all at least two metres wide, which is our standard for a footway. It's just footway cycleways that are required to go up to the three metres. OK. All right. Um, I'll, 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 I'll leave that point. Uh, going back to um, the term of the flooding, um, I appreciate we're putting in Suds Pond and, of course, when you've got it as a green open space, you don't necessarily get the same level of flooding because there's drainage, um, you know, field drains in place. I'm assuming that will be taken into account in any flood on design. Mr. Evans, maybe? I don't know who would want to take that one. Oh, sorry, I thought that was directed at... Uh, at Either of you, I don't mind who wants to. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just conscious that, um, you know, a lot of these fields have historic um, drainage, um, drain fields. Field drains, even I'm doing yours. Yeah, the, the drainage, 
The drainage assessment did make reference to historic instances of flooding. However, those took place to the north of the application site here okay. and affected the sort of low lying ground around the core path and the, the sort of dip where it goes underneath the railway line. So the drainage scheme that's proposed wouldn't exacerbate that because it would it would collect um, surface water from the site and release it at a controlled rate so that it, it wouldn't make any existing drainage problem worse. And uh, in terms of being at risk from surface water flooding, um, you know, those historic instances take place some some distance to the north. OK, and, and again, I suppose obviously water drains down, so I'm just conscious that we're obviously mm -hmm. along the other part, so it's just to make sure that we've, we've got that covered. Uh, and this yeah. is probably for you, uh, Mr Evans. In terms of the design, could, could you bring up what's actually next to the existing house? Is it, um, uh, is this East Lynn you're referring yes, to there? Uh -huh. Is it, it kind of looks like it's next to a, a parking bay. The drawings that you know, the, the, the design of the... Oh, sorry, you mean in the proposed parking. layout? Sorry, yes. yes I'm with uh -huh. you. Um, yeah, there's an area of car parking shown along here. Um, which would serve the, the houses and flats. Um, the landscaping scheme does show um, sort of enhanced landscaping along that boundary, um, which was thickened up um, as a result of revisions to the proposal. And I think the report refers to that being, I think it was Hawthorne and something else um, in a sort of double double line to try and um, provide some degree of screening and, and sort of guard against, you know, uh, car headlights and things flashing towards the property that's there. Do you know how what the physical distance is? Because again, you know, just from experience, I know where um, car parks have been put adjacent to people's homes. You know, it can of, often be used to car parks for, um, you know, sometimes antisocial behaviour. And, and as you say, that the flashing of the headlights has been a significant issue for many people. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the exact separation distance is there, but uh, the car park's obviously not. Um, uh, a, a long way off the site boundary. Um, mm -hmm. the, I, I think for frame of reference, the building here at A6 is something like 33, 34 metres away, but the car park is, is is fairly close to the boundary. So it's just a matter of what you can do with the boundary enclosures to to try and uh, contain that, that light spillage. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what is on the side of obviously the existing property in terms of it, of its bedroom windows or lounge or, or anything, but, you know, obviously about the immunity of that individual house, and whether it's just one house or not, you know, everybody's entitled to a level of immunity. So I, I do have a level of concern, um, but I'll, I'll bring in other members. Uh, Councillor Radley, I saw you first, then Councillor Cormie again. Thank you. Um, it was just... So there are sort of historic speeding problems along Langdike, Langdike's Road and Coast Road. Um, what mitigations are being put in place to ensure, you know, the increased traffic that's going to be in the area will be able to safely enter and exit the site? Um, I'd maybe ask Mr Leach just to field that question. I, I yeah, sorry, Mr you, Lynch. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> me, Scott. Too Scott too Ellis, been difficult. Um, to answer your question, nothing is being proposed on the existing road because, again, if it proved to be an issue, that's something traffic management could handle. At the moment, all the uh, measures we've put in have been internal to this application site because, obviously, the application is for this red line boundary and we've not had too much cause to put in um, traffic coming on the existing road, but that is something that could be done via traffic management if it was felt that it was required after the fact. Councillor Radley? Yeah, um, just there is going to be sort of significant increased traffic flow in the area. Is, is um, I mean, I'm quite new to this, but is there is there something that can be put in place prior to that? You know, I'm just concerned that there are, you know, a significant number of cars going to be utilising the space and pedestrians have to sort of be able to use the area as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, sorry. If I, jump, it's okay. if I jump back in, sorry. So, so is your concern with speeding traffic or just the volume of new traffic? Both. Um, you know, there's issues on Coast Road currently anyway. Um, are there going to be issues accessing and entering the site for both cars 
and pedestrians because there will be an increased volume of traffic. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. Um, so as aforementioned on the roads layout plan, we had after a few back and forth with the applicant asked them to putting um, tactiles and pedestrian crossings, sort of unsignalised ones, just sort of formal dropped curbs. So that is something they've shown. So that would help facilitate pedestrians getting in and out of the site. In terms of vehicles getting in and out, I don't foresee there being any issue because it's just your standard junctions. And um, if this, site, yeah, the site is north. Um, so at the southern access, for example, past that, there's not many other houses. So cars shouldn't have issue just turning in and out as you'd expect vehicles to. Yeah, if I could maybe just jump in from the planning side as well, Councillor Radley. Um, in assessing any planning application, ultimately what we're looking at is the impact of this proposal and um, what's before us and the, the impact associated with this development. So if there's a pre-existing issue with speeding, um, that's not necessarily associated with this development. So the council may have, have powers as, as Mr Lynch had, uh, mentioned in terms of traffic management to do something about that in the fullness of time. But uh, what we'd be looking at first and foremost is whether the existing road network um, can accommodate the level of traffic generated by this number of houses and whether um, whether there is existing, whether is, there is sufficient pedestrian infrastructure proposed to allow um, safe travel to, to the likes of schools and the surrounding um, pavements and things like that. So. Um, it's really just that separation of existing problems and problems generated by this development, if you if you see what I mean there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can turn there. Um, Mr Evans, can I just ask you about the comment by Scottish Water in regard to um, there, there hasn't been um, uh, an application in terms of identifying whether there's um, enough capacity in their system. Can you maybe just expand a little bit on what is required and what, what happens if there, there isn't identified enough capacity? Yeah, um, that's that's not uncommon um, for Scottish Water's consultation responses to, to say something along those lines. Ultimately, um, at the planning stage, they can give us a sort of an indication of whether there might be capacity, but that doesn't reserve or guarantee that capacity for a given development. And there's a separate process that the applicants would have to go through to to uh, apply for an application via Scottish Water and secure that connection. So that will still have to happen. And if it, if it can't happen, then the development you know, ultimately wouldn't be able to go ahead. Uh, Councillor Cormay, sorry, did you have another question or is that a historic hand? It's up. No, I have another question. Councillor Cormay, please, sorry, come in. Yeah, it's regarding the, the, the uh, 1.8 uh, metre uh, high fence adjacent to the, the network rail boundary. Has the, has the applicant committed to the future maintenance of that uh, security fence? Um, I'm not aware of any any such commitment, but uh, I think ultimately it would likely form part of any factoring uh, arrangement. Network rail have advised that that's necessary in order for, for their support for the application. Um, and the applicant would be obliged to provide it thereafter. I think it would just be captured along with all the other open space and landscaping as part of that factoring arrangement. Okay, Councillor Cormay. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, anything next to the railway line is quite a big development. Uh, I would like to see something more in black and white that this uh, fence would be, um, you know, maintained to a degree that uh, for, for safety. Uh, reasons because it's very close to the to the, uh, the railway line itself. Uh, yeah, there's condition, you know, somebody. Yeah, there's a, that, uh, of that fence be up kept. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, sorry, Councillor Cormy. Um, yes, there's um, a condition in relation to securing a detailed landscaping scheme and the implementation. Of that. Um, I think that would commonly include details uh, of. Um, the sort of ongoing factoring arrangements and, and a schedule for maintenance. Um, ultimately, it's up to the applicants to to undertake that work uh, thereafter. But uh, we would get an we would get a look at that for agreement prior to um, prior to the work being undertaken. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Evans, just to go back to the point I raised in terms of the treatment of that parking area adjacent to the existing house. 
I did look at the landscape steering scheme uh, condition at, on page 96, um, number 10 is the condition. Now, it doesn't indicate um, specifically about this, that particular house, it's, it, it's more general, um, a bit around the, um, sort of the western site boundary and the bay areas. Would it be possible to enhance that condition? Because I think, you know, we need to ensure that the, the amenity of that land, that owner is protected because, as I say, I, I, historically I've seen in other areas where this has become a, a real problem. And I think that knowing that this could exist, I think it would be helpful if we could have we added the line in to ensure that the treatment of that boundary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the landscaping details that have been provided include a, a number of sheets showing a more detailed sort of lay, landscaping layout for the site. So that gives us a, a clear understanding of what planting is proposed there. But if members were of, of a view that um, that may not be sufficient, then, you know, we could easily I, alter a condition to to capture some some additional planting or, or yeah. enhancement along that boundary. Yeah, I, I think we just need to reassure ourselves that, um, I mean, I'm obviously, I'll, I'll need to get the committee's agreement, but I think we, if we could put an extra line in that landscaping um, scheme, which does speak about the treatment of that particular part to ensure that it is uh, dense enough um, to, both from a, a light perspective, but also, a, you know, a privacy and, and um, um, sort of noise element as well. So I think if we could maybe just add something in there, I'll, I'll leave it and you can come back to a, a, a later stage, Mr Evans, <coughs> excuse me, if you've done in the past, it's an, an additional line or two, I think it would be helpful. Um, if yeah, members that's are, no problem. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I see there is a hand up. Councillor Greg. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I'm supporting what you've just said. Um, I wondered if we could actually see if, if it could be in where, where, where that would be, it's just for clarity. The okay. landscape planting, Councillor Craig. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're just referring to this boundary here, which is between the uh, the car park area and yeah. the existing property at East Lynn there. Right, OK, thank you. That's great. OK, thank you, Councillor Greg. Um, any further questions before? No. OK, um, I'll just get back to the right page. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt, Councillor. I can uh -huh. see that Councillor McKenzie and Councillor Radley has got their hands up, but that might be previous. It's not showing on my system. That's oh. not. <laughs> Are either of you ladies requiring to ask a question? No, I've got nothing to ask. It must be historic. No. Yeah, I'm that's showing down. down now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up, though, uh, Ms. McBain. Okay, so moving on to the recommendation, which is a willingness to approve subject to conditions and subject to the conclusion of a legal agreement, securing payment of developers' obligations and ensuring that the development is delivered exclusively as affordable housing. We also have um, a number of conditions, which are on page 93 to 98. Conditions, page 98 to 99, have the advisory notes. We've talked about um, an additional um, line in the landscaping um, condition to protect the immunity um, of the existing dwelling there. And with that in mind, uh, are we happy to approve? Anybody otherwise by the Thanks for uh, Convener, would, uh -huh. does that include the secured by design, whether it's an informative or otherwise? As an informative note as well, Councillor Greg. Thank you yeah. for reminding me. Great, thanks. Yes, okay, are we agreed? Again, Ms. McBain, can I just get you to go through um, the, the roll call just to ensure we have it for the record? Thank you, convener. I'll just do the same again. So if members can please indicate that they're um, happy to approve the application um, conditionally. So Councillor Bolton? Agreed. Councillor Stewart? Agreed. <coughs> Councillor Allen? Agreed. Councillor Cook? Agreed. Councillor Radley? Agreed. Councillor Cormie. Agreed. Councillor Greg. Agreed. Councillor McKenzie. Agreed. And Councillor Malik. Agreed. Okay, so that's unanimous again, um, approved conditionally with that extra um, part of the condition and also the secured by design informative. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um
So we're moving on to item 6.3, which is detailed planning permission for the redevelopment, including the change of use and extension of existing buildings to a mixed use unit, which can accommodate 50 residential units, co working office space. Cafe bar, um, the erection of a commercial unit to accommodate co working maker space and a gym and associated work at Albergate, Sony Wood Park, Aberdeen on pages 101 to 156. And we have um, planning reference 200833. And the planning officer is Mr. Ferguson. Alex. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll just see if I can share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, uh, not yet. We've got a picture of you, which is very nice in a circle. Can you see? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I did see something come, a message has come up saying bad network quality, but. <laughs> You're, you're still not trying sure. to share. Yeah, okay. No problem. That's it, you're there. This is still still not showing. Sure. Yeah, no, you're showing, you're all right. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um good morning, Council. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um this application seeks detailed plan information for the redevelopment of the Albigate office building and its cartilage on Stonywood Park to create a mixed use development. Um, the existing building would be converted and extended to accommodate 50 residential units, co working space, a cafe, bar, and some internal and external amenity space for the occupants of the residential units. Um, Can everyone hear me? Yes, hi, you're a little bit um, robotic, but, you, but we can make it out. I'll let you know if it gets a bit too much. OK. Sorry, it's my, my internet connection is a wee bit dodgy. Um, yeah, let me know if I, if I cut out again in the future. <laughs> um, Okay. So uh, a new a new commercial building is also proposed within the site. Um, this building would accommodate a uh, gymnasium and maker space. Uh, the remainder of the site would be retained as car parking served by the existing internal road. Um, the proposal is for the creation of a co-living development concept that provides accessible residential um, accommodation. Uh, that benefits from a, a range of on-site shared facilities, amenities and commercial space. The commercial uses would also be available to the wider public. Um, I'll start off by running through a few slides to show the existing context of the site and to demonstrate what is being proposed. I'll then briefly summarize how the proposals relate to the policies of the local development plan and cover the main issues and the reason for our recommendation. Thank you. So um, the Albergate office building is located on the southern side of Stonywood Park, adjacent to its junction with Stonywood uh, Road. Alec, you're, um, you're in Stonywood, just to the south. Alec, sorry, uh, can the I site stop? lies at the entrance to the Stonywood Park Industrial Estate. It's okay, it started because they, they, they weren't actually so, moving on. <laughs> um, this is not showing. It, it's showing now, it just hadn't moved on, but you're fine now. Got so, some plan up. Can you? Okay, apologies. I'll I'll wait a few seconds. And switch slides. Um, um, so the the site lies at the entrance to the Stonywood Park Industrial Estate, with the BP headquarters to the north, um, and an industrial storage unit and yard immediately to the east. The residential neighbourhood of Stonewood lies to the south with two detached residential properties immediately adjoining the site's southern boundary. Um, Stonywood Road lies uh, uh, runs along the western boundary of the site with the Aberdeen to Inverness railway line and Wellhead's industrial estate beyond um, Aberdeen International Airport situated further to the west. Um, the approximately rectangular site covers an area of 1.4 hectares and comprises a two-story 1970s office building with a square footprint surrounding a central courtyard area. Alex, 
Alex, sorry. The building sits have... centrally within the site um, and Alex. is surrounded on all sides by an internal access road. It, your your slides are not moving on very quickly. Yeah. I don't know which one you're meant to be at. We've got existing site layout on the, up at the moment. Yeah, that's, yeah, that that's one the one with, um, with the site shown in colour and everything else white. Yeah, that's fine. It's come up. Thank you. Perfect. Um, um, the western edge of the site sees an established tree belt provide an element of screen to Stonywood Road and there is further sporadic trees and pockets of landscaping along the other boundaries. Um, now the next slide I'm putting up is an aerial image, um, which might take a while. Um, it shows, uh, this slide shows an aerial image of the building viewed from the south. Um, if it's, if you can see that. Okay. Um, the building is flat roofed and its elevations are, pr are predominantly constructed with reflective curtain wall glazing. Can, can um, I stop? Can it I should stop be noted that this image minute. is slightly dated and precedes the erection of a detached well. Alex, is, would it be, is there anybody yeah. else that can manage your slides, maybe that's got a better connection? I don't know if that's possible. It's just so that you can find a way yeah. of uh, That would so be Gavin, probably a good idea. Sorry, uh, there, just to interrupt, um, Gavin's going to try and share the Scott, presentation maybe. and then Alex can um, put his camera off and maybe this, the, vo the audio will be a little bit clearer. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Thanks. Sorry, Alec, you've, you've put in a lot of work and I didn't want it to be lost. That's great, that's it up now. Just let me know when you need to change slides, Alex. No, no that's fine, thank you. Yeah, it'll be like a government briefing on COVID. Next slide, please. Um, right. So yeah, Gavin, if you can put it on the aerial image slide, that would be fantastic. Yep, that's it up now, I think. Yeah, it's there. Okay, I can't, I can't see it. Um, it's definitely the okay. analysis. Um, so you can see the aerial image. Yes. Okay. Um, next, next slide, please, Gavin, for the um, existing building. It shows the front elevation of the building, which faces north towards Stonywood Park. And then, if you can move on to the next one, um, which should have four four images. Um, which show the slide, should, yeah, that's the one, I can see it now. Um, so this slide shows photos of the other three elevations of the building and the surrounding. The taller trees visible on the right-hand side of the top left image um, along the eastern boundary um, are covered by a, a tree protection order, but they all lie within the cartilage of the neighbouring industrial site to the east. Um, next slide. Um, so these images show some views of the southern and eastern boundaries taken within, for, taken from within the site. The top two images are of the two residential properties that immediately adjoin the site's southern boundary at 326 and 328 Stonywood Road. Um, and the bottom image shows those mature trees to the east. Um, next slide, please. So um, in terms of the Aberdeen Local Development Plan zoning, the site lies within a wider area of business and industrial land, which borders residential land to the south. Um, a mixed use zoning lies to the north of the Stonywood Park Industrial Estate with the River Don to the east and Aberdeen Airport further to the west. 
the site lies just within a, 40, a 57 decibel area as shown on the Aberdeen Airport noise contour map. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows the, the site plan as proposed. As you can see, the existing building is proposed to be retained with extensions added to the northern part of the building on its front and side elevations. The existing internal road and car parking areas would largely remain as existing with some alterations, and the new commercial building would be sited in the northeastern part of the site. Um, that building would incorporate undercroft car parking under the western half of the building at ground level, so the footprint of the building would be slightly larger than, than that shown on this plan. Um, this plan shows the ground floor layout of both buildings. Um, the main building would retain the front entrance on its northern elevation, which would serve the cafe bar area on the left-hand side um, and parking office space on the right-hand side. The entrance would be shared by the commercial uses and the occupants of the residential units, although the residential units could also be accessed separately from the car park via entrances to the south and west. The blue area running from the main entrance through the, car, through the courtyard would double as an internal amenity space for, for residents. Um, the walkway through the court, courtyard would be covered, but um, able to open up in times of good weather um, to provide a small area of external amenity space. Um, several of the ground floor flats would have access to private garden areas, either within the courtyard or to the east and west of the building. The grey areas in each cor corner of the site are bin and cycle stores. And next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. Yep, floor plans are up, Alex. Hello? Yeah. The floor plans are on screen, Alex. Oh, OK, sorry. I, that's really slow for me. I can't see it. Um, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, so this slide shows the proposed floor plans for the main building. On the ground floor, the cafe bar our area is shown in grey, um, the co-working co office space in yellow, and the internal communal amenity space in green. Um, on all of the floor plans, the light blue coloured units are one-bed flats, with the pink units comprising two-bed flats. In total, there would be 37 one-bed units and 13 two-bed units. Um, some of the upper floor units would have access to balconies or roof terraces. Um, next slide, please. So the mixed-use building elevations. That's up now. So this this slide shows the elevations. Thanks. Um, this slide shows the elevations of the main mixed-use building as proposed. Um, although the precise materials and finish of the building is not yet known, those elements are subject to condition. Um, with full details and samples to be provided before the commencement of development. Um, the images do show, however, that the existing building would be extended and reclad in a more contemporary manner. Um, this image also shows that it is proposed to add another park story to the building at its, at its northern end. Um, next slide, please. So the commercial unit um, floor plans and elevations. Alex. It's on now, is it? Yes. Perfect. Um, so this slide shows the floor plans and elevations of the proposed new commercial building um, that would be sited in the northeastern corner of the site. The building would be predominantly three storeys in height with a stair tower and lift shaft element at the southern end of the roof, um, providing access to a roof terrace. The ground floor of the building would be used as maker space, shown in light green, which would sit behind the undercroft car parking. The upper floors of the building would be used as a gym, both for the residents and the wider public. 
And as with the main building, the external would, um, would be finalized by a condition. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So streetscape elevations. Um, so this slide shows a contextual elevation of the two buildings. The top image shows the buildings when viewed from the south, and the lower image shows the building when viewed from the north on Stonywood Park. Um, next slide, please, the in indicative 3D renders. So this, this slide is fairly self-explanatory, just shows indicative images of what the buildings may look like. And then the last slide um, is uh, similar indicative 3D renders showing how the internal um, communal amenity space and co-working spaces may look. So thankfully that's the last slide. Um, so in terms of the main issues related to the proposals, these can be summarized as follows. Um, the redevelopment of the office building and site for residential use is contrary to policy B1 of the local development plan. However, the applicant has demonstrated that there is little to no demand for the continued use of the site for class four offices and the planning service accepts that the wider situation across the city sees in an oversupply of business and industrial land. Combined with the proposals to provide additional housing of a relatively, relatively unique type in the city and with the site's location on the periphery of the industrial estate, ensuring that there would be no significant conflict with neighboring uses, it is considered that these, these are material considerations of sufficient weight to justify a departure from policy B1 of the local development. It should be noted that uh, the proposal fails to meet the requirements of several policies and supplementary guidance if considered as mainstream housing. However, whilst the, main, whilst the planning service is concerned that a satisfactory residential environment could not be created for a mainstream residential development, it is considered that the proposed co-living residential model can be supported in a build to rent, private rented, ten, private rented sector. The proposed development fits with several of the characteristics of built to rent housing, as noted in the Scottish Government's planning delivery advice on built to rent. That document notes that um, in built to rent schemes, typically residents will have access to wider on site amenities that extend beyond the traditional boundaries of an individual housing unit. The built to rent differs from the traditional homes built for sale. Um, and that it, uh, built to rent can be characterized by single institutional ownership and professional on-site management of the entire development. Um, crucially, the government's advice notes that the retention of built to rent units in the rented sector should be explored, particularly where a tailored approach has been taken to normal standards. Um, in this case, given the aforementioned issues that prevent the development from being acceptable as main mainstream for sale of housing, the planning service considers that the development can only be su uh, supported subject to appropriate controls that would keep 45 of the agenda pack and the restriction in uh, Section 75 legal agreement would prevent the sale of individual residential units to owner occupiers and those measures are considered necessary to ensure that the development would be acceptable. The flexible approach taken to normal standards permitted in built to rent schemes is due to the more temporary nature of such accommodation compared to homes that are owned by an occupier. Um, if those appropriate uh, if those appropriate controls are applied, then the planning services satisfied that the development would offer for a high quality, relatively unique model of housing within the city that would add to the range of residential accommodation on offer. In terms of the potential impact on the DICE neighborhood center, the planning service considers that the development would not detract from the vitality or viability of the dirt and may enhance it by uh, providing increased. Um, aside from matters of principle and residential tenure, a noise impact assessment has been submitted, the findings of which are supported by, by environmental health. Um, subject to the attachment of various conditions, one being that uh, the requirement for the residential building to incorporate suitable sound insulation to ensure that the residents would not be adversely affected by noise from aircraft or the nearby roads and roads. Um, the development would provide 25% of the units as affordable housing. It's anticipated that these would take the form of units on site operated. 
Um, the applicant is also agreeable to paying developer obligations toward the core path network, education, healthcare, open space, and transportation. Um, in terms of transport and accessibility, it is considered that sufficient car parking would be provided within the site when taken into account the site text and proximity to public transport and the nature of the development. Um, EV charge points and cycle parking need to be installed in accordance with the Council's supplementary guidance, and the applicant has agreed to provide two car club cars within the site, the provision of which would be addressed via the legal agreement. In terms of trees, some trees would be removed within the site, but those proposed for removal are not considered to be any of any significant value. Following concerns were raised by the occupant of the neighbouring uh, residential property to the south. Trees initially proposed to be removed from the, from the southern boundary are now to be retained following amendments to the internal layout. Um, the proposed commercial building in the northeastern corner of the site has been pulled away from the eastern boundary slightly since the application was submitted and the planning service has satisfied that the building would not cause significant harm to the root protection areas or canopies of the protected trees in the, adjacent, in the adjacent site to the east. Um, the design and scale of the existing building to be altered and extended as well as the new commercial building are considered to be suitable given the context of the site and would likely result in a visual enhancement compared to the existing situation. Um, in respect of all, all other matters such as drainage, waste, archaeology and digital, digital infrastructure, the proposal is compliant with the relevant policies of the local plan. The Dyson Stonywood Community Council neither support nor object to the proposed development, but noted some concerns that are addressed in the committee report. Um, three objections were also received from members of the public look, with various concerns raised. Um, as with the Community Council comments in the report. Um, specifically, however, it can be noted that some amendments have been made to the proposal since the application was originally submitted. Um, as noted, um, these include the emission of balconies on the building's southern elevation and the retention of the, the existing trees along the southern boundary, both of which would help to minimise the impact of the development on the amenity of the neighbouring properties to the south. Therefore, subject to the conditions listed on pages 145 to 152 of the agenda pack, and subject to a legal agreement to restrict the tenure of the development and secure affordable housing and developer obligations, the application is recommended for approval. Um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ferguson. You. And you have my um, sympathy because you're struggling with <laughs> I think that was a valiant effort to try and try and do it. And thank you, Mr. Evans, for uh, supporting Mr. Ferguson uh, through that. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, right, members, I've got Councillor McKenzie, then Councillor to Councillor McKenzie. First of all, I'd like to make a comment. I know that building, I've been inside it many years ago, and the indicative picture of the indicative renders is vastly exaggerating the space between the building and the road. And my main concern in front of that building is BP and then on the other side is the blocks of flats that we approved last year. I'm already getting a lot of complaints from local residents about the contractors parking there. If this development goes ahead, I really don't think there's sufficient parking between the residential area and the cafe bar. I would have serious concerns. Your question how, many, how many cars do you think we would be able to accommodate within the grounds? Mr. Ferguson or um so I'll, I'll maybe let um, Mr. Lynch um, advise, but uh, in summary, I think um, we, we accepted that um, I think there's a total of, of 61 car parking spaces, including 49 regular spaces, eight disabled bays, um, two electric vehicle spaces, and then there's also proposed to be two car club cars um, sited within, within the site, um, which would be available for residents and for the, the wider um, public as well. Um, the site lies um, close to good public transport links with a, a bus stop immediately adjacent to the site um, on Stonywood Road. Um, 
and uh, I think part of the, the reason Scott, uh, Mr Lynch, um, might be able to explain further, but um, it's anticipated that users of the commercial uses um, would either reside on the site itself or possibly in the surrounding residential area, um, thus the facilities would, would be walkable to many um, and result in, in, in not too many um, car trips. Um, and that was about what I had. Uh, Mr Lynch, are you able to advise further on car parking? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, as Mr Ferguson said, and as per my fairly comprehensive report that will be uploaded on the internet, um, it's felt that the parking, which should only be 0.8 per dwelling, and then the associated parking for all the other uses, can have an element of shared use between them. For example, the gym, it's not felt that people will come from very far flung to use quite a small gym. It'll be residents or people nearby who could walk or cycle. And it's the same with the cafe and other uses. And then between that and the car club provision, this the shortfall isn't much. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Councillor McKenzie. No, not really. I mean, there is, there will be an issue. There's going to be an issue with the block of flats, and it's going to be exaggerated with this development. I, I don't think the parking that we're permitting here is um, far different than what was permitted at the block of flats beside the BP building that you referenced yourself earlier. It's very much in line with what we've approved previously for other similar sites adjacent. Can I maybe ask Mr Lynch how that it compares with our, I think might help Councillor McKenzie, the, the parking standards that we would expect for this type of development? Uh, yes, of course, I'll just read um, verbatim the section I wrote in my report. So the following maximum, maximum standards apply to the various commercial uses of the development. So the cafe um, would be allowed a maximum of 43 spaces, the offices would be allowed a maximum of 18, the gym would be allowed a maximum of 42 spaces. Um, so as such, for the commercial development, a maximum of 100 spaces were permitted. Um, so including the residential, this equates to a maximum allowable provision of 167 car parking spaces. Um, the proposal was for 61 parking spaces, and um, that includes two electric vehicles, and uh, uh, sorry, two car club vehicles. And as car club cars, replace 17 secondary ownership. The two car club cars then equate to 34 spaces. So um, with all that, that's the equivalent of 93 parking spaces, which is 74 less than the maximum. However, in my response, I then break down why that's felt allowable, which I can also read out if you would like. Councillor McKenzie, do you want further? I mean, it is, as I say, it's in the report, but it was just to clarify anything that maybe was slightly... Um, no, that's, that's OK. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Coop. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just a couple of questions. An initial comment, just to reassure Mr. Ferguson, although he did sound a bit tinny, I could actually hear all the words he was saying. Um, uh, and if it's any consolation and comfort, um, I've been on two or three calls recently where the people presenting, I just couldn't hear them at all. So um, we got there in the end, even if it wasn't seamless. Um, in, in, yeah. Yeah, in, terms, in terms of the questions, um, it was really on the on the noise impact assessment um, in the I think it's condition five. Mm -hmm. um, there's reference to a couple of noise impact assessments from I think it's Sandy Brown. Um, I, I could see the yeah. 30th of July one in the background papers, which is talking about a fence along Stonywood Road which I guess will, will um, protect against traffic noise. I couldn't see, I mean, it might be me being just blind. I couldn't yeah. see the, the November one, um, which presumably would refer to um, mitigations from aircraft noise. Um, so I wondered if uh, you could just expand a wee bit on, what, on what's in that one um, and tell me I'm not being daft because I couldn't see it. Okay, so... Yeah, so the so the um, 
the original noise impact assessment submitted in July uh, includes the mitigation measures um, to deal with aircraft noise. So those principal measures are um, increased sound uh, insulation for the facade of the building, which requires to be implemented, and also that there would be a, a closed window policy. So the windows for the flats wouldn't be openable um, by and large, and the, um, the, the flats would be serviced by mechanical ventilation. Um, so the the aircraft noise is dealt with in the, the original um, noise impact assessment. The follow-up noise impact assessment submitted in November was in relation to noise from the gym within the commercial unit. Um, and that uh, that also recommended the same measure that uh, the windows aren't openable and that it's serviced by, by mechanical ventilation. Um, just in respect of the acoustic fence, so that was um, a, a fence, a timber fence along the western boundary of the of the site onto Stonywood Road was recommended in the original noise assessment in order to um, mitigate against noise uh, impacting on the tree belt to the west, which was originally proposed as external amenity space for the for the occupants. However, um, we considered that that space as a tree belt doesn't function, wouldn't function uh, as an external amenity space. Um, therefore, uh, and we also considered that the fence would have had a detrimental impact visually on Stonywood Road. So given that we didn't, didn't consider the tree belt to function as um, usable uh, amenity space, we, we considered it no longer required that protection from noise um, from, from road traffic. And uh, given the, the, the visual impact of the fence, we, we asked for that to be removed from the proposal so that the fence is no longer proposed. OK, thanks for that. Um, just in terms of the, the non-opening window. Is that answer you? Um, I mean, conscious at the moment, I mean, COVID won't last forever, but one of the mitigations that we're being asked to do is to yes. open our windows. You've also got the situation wherein July and August for like to open the windows because of the heat. Yes. And there's also the issue of um, damp and mould and getting fresh air yeah. into premises is, an, is a way of combating that. Um, so I'm wondering about that. And also, um, I'm not sure I would buy a flat that had windows that didn't yes. open because I'd be wondering, what do I do in the event of fire? Yeah, sorry, I, I think I maybe slightly misspoke there. In terms of windows, I, I think it's more that the windows don't need to be opened for the flats to be appropriately ventilated. I probably misspoke in the, um, I think the windows would be openable, it's just that they don't require to be open to provide adequate ventilation. Um, given that uh, several of the units would be served by balconies and roof terraces, obviously they would be openable windows. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. And if I'd put two and two together, I would have worked out that if you've got a balcony, you would be able to open Is the window to get out. Uh, so. OK, or I can't remember. Sorry if you had a, a further. Question. No, that's it. That's it. Thanks. OK. Um, OK. Is there other questions? Yes. Yes. Correct. OK. Can, can I just ask, um, Mr. Ferguson, obviously the condition one, which restricts the tenure to um, meaning they can only be rented. Uh, that's obviously quite a, an unusual condition. And, you know, obviously, I, I know you made reference to some of the Scottish government guidance on sort of um, PRS, etc. I, I just wondered if you could expand a little bit more on that, because I suppose it's just making sure that well, we're, we're obviously approving a planning application. I absolutely understand about protecting the amenity, but when we've had other applications for you know, larger housing where we're areas where we're obviously making sure there's uh, the grounds are being maintained and that type of thing. And, you know, Councillor Cormley mentioned about the fence on the last application. Now, my understanding, part of the discussion we obviously had around this was about protecting um, the amenity internally because there was a lack of in external immunity. Can, can you kind of, I suppose, just um, give me a little bit more around the that condition one, because I'm, I'm just slightly uncomfortable where we're beginning to almost impact on the economics of a, a development 
Um, so I just need to be reassured why we're doing it and that we're quite within our rights to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, as as noted in the report, there's there's a number of amenity deficits. What we would usually seek for for a mainstream residential development. So in this instance, um, the flatted units are not not predominant predominantly aren't uh, particularly generous in terms of their internal floor areas. Um, the vast majority would be single aspect units. Um, the development would not incorporate any um, usable open space. Um, and there would also be a potential conflict between the residential uses and more the, the residential units and the adjacent um, commercial units. Um, so uh, we, we feel that the development falls within um, the remit and shares a lot of the characteristics that are noted in the Scottish Government's advice on built to rent tenure. Um, it's, it's anticipated that uh, rental homes are of a more temporary nature than, or likely to be of a more temporary nature than, a, than permanent uh, owned homes. Um, and uh, the, as, as noted, the, the Scottish Government advice does state that where a flexible approach has been taken to um, kind of your normal standards for amenity, um, which it has in this case, um, that um, it, it should be explored, the opportunity should be explored to retain um, the rented units within the rented sector as opposed to allowing um, private sales. Um, we do have a, a slight concern as well that um, should the associated um, ancillary commercial facilities um, cease to operate in the future, um, for whatever reason, then um, it's obviously easier for somebody who's renting to be able to vacate their, their property than it would be for, for an owner or occupier if those facilities were no longer available to, to the occupants. So that's, that's kind of the reasoning behind um, condition one and uh, our, our recommendation that there's a restriction in the legal agreement. Okay, um, and this one which maybe sounds strange where you've got a, a, um, a sad question getting developers contribution, but given the mix of the, the, the housing, which is one and two bedroom flats, and then the type of environment it is, I'm a little surprised that we sought developers contributions in terms of the education provision, given I, I don't see many families locating in this type of establishment, and I suppose it's just for sort of clarity on why we would seek it. Um, I think in that regard, it's, it's the formula um, kind of calculated by or used by developer obligations as a kind of standard um, formula. I don't think it really takes account of the nuance of perhaps whether or not this development um, might be likely to accommodate children or not. Um, so I think in that regard, it's, it's basically being calculated using the, the existing the, the formula and the guidance that we have. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Ferguson. Any further questions for Mr. Ferguson? I'm not seeing any hands. I'm just doing a quick check. Ms. McBain, I'm sure will keep me right if I miss anyone. <laughs> I can't see anyone. No, I okay. can't see anyone. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. OK, the recommendation is willingness to approve subject conditions and legal agreement to secure on-site affordable housing, restrict the tenure of the development to the private rented sector and secure developers' obligation towards the car club, core path network, secondary education, health care facilities and open space. Um, are we content to approve that application or is anybody otherwise minded? to see if I can see any hands. No, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, Ms. McBain, can I just get you to go to, again, a roll call vote, please? No problem. Thank you, convener. So again, if can, members can just indicate that they're happy to approve the application in line with the recommendations. So, Councillor Bolton? Agreed. Councillor Stewart? Agreed. Councillor Allen? Agreed. Councillor Cook? Agreed. Councillor Radley? Agreed. Councillor Cormie? Agreed. Councillor Mackenzie? Agreed. Councillor Malik? Agreed. Thank you. So that's the application approved unanimously. Um, you missed me out. 
Oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Greg, sorry. <laughs> Approve. Sorry, that is <laughs> unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Greg. We, how could we forget you? Um, okay, we're moving on to where the recommendation is one of refusal, and it's at 7.1. Detailed planning permission for the redevelopment of an existing site for the erection of 17 residential flats over four storeys, including demolition and all associated works at 15 Maberley Street, Aberdeen, on pages 157 to 182. Planning reference 200621, and it's planning officers, Mr. Hobbs. Mr. Hobbs. Thank you, convener. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I won't have the same technical problems that Alex has experienced there. So Thanks. what I'll do um, with my presentation, I'll just keep my camera switched off. Hopefully that will make a more stable internet connection. Um, so I'll briefly take you through the presentation I've done and um, follow that up with just a summary of the, of the key issues raised by the proposal. And um, I'm happy to take any questions following that. Thank you. So I'll just try and hopefully share the screen here. Hopefully this will work. Um, hopefully that's you've got the screen there now. Hopefully You're there. Yeah, perfect. There. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So um, as you said, this is a detailed planning application for 17 flats. And the site, uh, this is the location plan, hopefully that's showing currently. Uh, so the site's bounded to the north by Marberley Street. Um, and it's a city centre site currently developed and previously occupied by a printer's uh, workshop, which has been vacant for a, a couple of years. Um, so, so the surroundings, are, you've got very much built um, a, an urban form where you've got tenemental flatted properties and a mix of uses in the surrounding area. Uh, this is the, the site plan uh, as proposed. So what we've got um, is basically a, build, a proposal is to demolish the, the existing buildings on the site. You've got there's obviously a substantial granite building currently um, fronting onto Marberley Street and extending the full length of the site currently. Uh, and the proposal is to replace that with a with a, a new build flatted block which occupies uh, approximately 53% of the site coverage and in the rear of the site there'd be a, a communal garden area for the use of residents of the development. Um, in terms of the, uh, the ground floor layout, what we've got is, uh, hopefully that's showing now, what you're seeing there is uh, there's basically single aspect flats on facing onto Marberley Street and at the rear of the site there's single aspect flats facing onto the communal rear garden area. And these the flats are all uh, one bedroom flats that are proposed. So there's, um, and they're all sharing a communal entrance point from Marberley Street, which is uh, just accessed there off of the central point in the building. And the upper floors pretty much replicate the ground floor plan. And you've got sort of four stories, although the top floor of the development is pretty much contained within the roof space of the development. So in effect, in terms of the visual appearance of the development, you've got a, effectively it looks like a three storey building when viewed from from the north, which is the key, the principal elevation. So you, you can see there that what, what, what is proposed is a mix of materials on the, the front elevation, uh, partly grey smooth render, which is this lightly shaded area here, and also granite uh, reused from downtakings on parts of the frontage. In terms of side elevations, sorry, this is the rear south elevation, so that's facing onto uh, the rear of tenements on um, Craigie Street. There's four storey tenements which face onto the, this elevation approximately 20 metres distant. So the rear part of the site there, uh, you, when those windows are proposed, they're facing onto the rear of the tenement on Craigie Street, pretty much directly facing. Um, but about 20 metres separation between the windows. Um, and the east elevation here, this is this is basically facing away from, or facing towards rather, uh, George Street. So we've got partly granite on the, the gable here and partly smooth render. And similarly on the, uh, the west elevation, which is obviously visible when you're heading towards George Street, 
the front part of the site here, you've partly got granite uh, wrapping around onto this gable elevation, but mo the most of the gable here is actually uh, smooth render. Um, and if you contrast that with the existing situation, this is the aerial photo. Uh, this is the granite building, which occupies the whole of the west part of the site. So currently, uh, it's obviously quite prominent in views along the street. And uh, you've got of the context here, as I say, it's pretty much tenemental. You've got uh, three story mansard roofed Victorian tenements on the north side of Marbury Street. And you've got uh, that's that's the view looking towards um, George Street. So apologies, it actually says a view west, but it's actually the view east along Marbury Street looking towards the, the junction with George Street. So this elevation here, obviously this is where you've got substantial granite currently, um, and that would be largely render as proposed. And that's the, 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 the existing front elevation of the building. So it's quite a, quite a substantial granite structure, which is there currently. Uh, in terms of the uh, the application, so obviously what we've got is it's a, as I say, it's a detailed application, 17 flats, um, the context is a tenemental context in the city centre. Um, in terms of the uh, proposal, it's obviously it's supported by a design statement. The applicant has, has attempted to justify the proposal uh, by referring, reference to um, historic developments in the surrounding area. Um, I'll come on to that later. Um, in terms of consultations, there's no objections from the consultees. Um, the issues raised there are obviously summarised in the report of handling. Um, in terms of representations, obviously that's the main reason this is in front of the committee is because the, the number of objections that have been received. Um, so the, the objections raise a number of issues, including loss of the granite building, uh, the general design quality, overdevelopment concerns, um, amenity concerns, both for the existing occupants and uh, in terms of potential occupants of the flats as well and traffic stroke parking concerns. So in terms of policies, again, uh, the key issues that, that are really highlighted by the development, the site obviously lies within the city centre. So policy NC1, city centre development, obviously that encourages residential development in the city centre, and that's pretty much supported by um, and aligns, aligns with the city centre master plan. And um, so the site is zoned as H2, which is a mixed use area uh, and within those areas, um, the acceptability of, of residential use is dependent on uh, creation of an acceptable level of amenity and also demonstration that there's no significant conflict with existing uses. So in terms of the assessment, what we've, uh, the, the principle of development obviously is accepted in terms of the, uh, the introduction of housing use into the city centre that is supported by various policies within the local plan and at, at uh, SPP level. Um, the key issue that, that we see though in terms of the assessment is really the, the, the use of the loss of the existing granite building in terms of the, the re and the re reuse of granite within the development. So uh, policy D5, that's uh, our granite heritage within the local plan that basically um, that, that obviously clearly encourages the uh, retention of existing granite structures where possible and reuse of granite within the development. So in terms of the assessment, what we've gone, we've gone back to the agent in terms of the, uh, the extent of granite use, because in, in essence, from a design quality point of view, we're looking for a more extensive use of granite within the development in terms of the, the whole of the frontage and side elevations. Uh, we don't feel that the use of uh, a render on the front elevation is either appropriate in the context or or would weather particularly well. And um, so this, the other factor here is obviously the, the technical advice note regarding use of materials, which was approved by the Council in March 2020. Um, obviously, that's a relevant material consideration because the application came in in June 2020, so um, that obviously it shifts things on in terms of the assessment relative to the appropriateness of um, any development um, in terms of the quality of its materials. So for those reasons, conflict with policy D1, uh, which is quality place making by design, um, policy D5, our granite heritage and 
as I say, supported by the materials technical advice note. It's not felt that there's a justification for approval of development, notwithstanding the benefits uh, that introduction of housing into the city centre uh, would, would, would create. Um, obviously, if the, if the recommendation is not accepted, there's um, the this, this scope for use of material, uh, scope for use of conditions to address a number of issues, technical issues, and um, also um, potential use of our uh, developer obligations by securing a legal agreement. Um, so that could be dealt with uh, if, if deemed necessary. And happy to take any questions relating to those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Forbes. Uh, questions uh, for Mr. Forbes? Uh, Councillor Cormie. Councillor Cormie. Councillor Cormie. Thanks, Councillor Cormie. Anybody at Northern Melbourne is speaking to us. And my first question my first is, question uh, Mr. Wells, how long has this building been lying? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Cormie, can you hear me? Hello, yes, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, how yes, long has um, this building been lying empty? We don't have an exact date, but um, from our knowledge of the history of the site, there's this recent application submitted in 2018 uh, for a, a similar development by the same applicant, sorry, same agent rather. And uh, so it must it, at that time it was vacant. So it, it, it's certainly around about two years. It would seem that it's been on the market and seems to be still on the market as far as, as far as you can see. So it looks like I would say roughly just an estimate, but an estimate roughly two years that it's been vacant. Yeah, I, mean, uh, uh, I don't want to get any more questions, but anybody who knows Mulberry Street, it's a, it's a varied street. I mean, there's a Broadford work there, the red. Brick, there's lock court, uh, sheltered housing. There's not all that much granite buildings here. That particular building, if I'm correct, there is a wall in front of it, Mr. Forbes. Am I right? A granite wall. So you're not really seeing that frontage very well. There is a wall adjacent to the site. Uh, so there's a quite a substantial granite wall which screens the electrical substation to the west. Um, the site itself, obviously, the, the, the granite building sits on the pavement edge, so that's right on the, the curb line of the, um, you've got the pavement and the building sits immediately adjacent to that, so it's, you know, it is very visible from the street. So really, uh, in my opinion, looking at this, the only thing uh, is... Bill, can we stick to questions, Councillor Cormley, sorry, can we stick to questions at this stage? Well, well OK, the, the question is, the only thing that's letting this site down is the, is the granite, uh, the lack of use, because it ticks every other box, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for city centre living. Uh, is that uh, Councillor Cormley, we're on questions. Well, <laughs> is, the lack, is it the lack of granite being uh, recycled? Is that what the problem is here? Fundamentally, uh, yes, that's that's the main reason for refusal is the well, it's related to the design in, in general. But yes, the, um, the extent of granite reuse is the issue, as I said, on the frontage, the extent of the frontage and wrapping around on the side elevations. Basically, we're looking for more extensive use of granite in recognition of the, uh, the context, which is very much, as I say, historic granite buildings, although it's not a conservation area and it's not a listed building, so there's no there's no statutory protection for the building itself, but our policies, uh, obviously policy D5, as I say, supported by the materials technical advice note, uh, both of them make great emphasis on, on the, uh, the importance of the granite in terms of Aberdeen's heritage. So it's for those reasons that we're seeking uh, an improvement to the design solution. Unfortunately, uh, we're not in a position to be able to recommend approval because we haven't reached agreement with the applicant. Thank you, Councillor Cormie. Any other questions for Mr. Forbes? Uh, uh, oh, Councillor uh, Stewart, then Councillor Cook. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, um, convener. I was just wondering, in terms of Mr. Forbes, um, if you were able to reach uh, some other form of agreement with the applicant, would the Planning Authority of Aberdeen City Council be minded to approve that? I mean, for example, are you looking for them to incorporate a bit of the granite into the proposed building 
or is there a feeling that no it just isn't appropriate from the, the planning authority's point of view yeah i think obviously there's a statutory duty to determine applications and we have to assess what's before us we can't speculate on on the basis of potential amendments which are not before us um so as you know obviously we've assessed the scheme as submitted in terms of the in fact, there was amendments to the design, but the amendments are, we don't feel have, have sufficiently addressed our concerns in terms of the design quality. Uh, so obviously we've got a duty to assess it, uh, what's in front of us, and it's for those reasons that we're, we're recommending refusal. If it was a different proposal, yeah, we might come up with a different recommendation, but I'm afraid that's not where, that's not where we are. Convener, may I come back, please? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just sort of mulling over what's been said there um, by Mr Forbes. And I was just wondering, um, after me asking the question, he indicated that they hadn't, the applicant and the council hadn't come to maybe uh, an agreed point that they could move forward. And then it was stated that we can only deal with what's in front of us. And I obviously I accept that. But where I'm coming from is, would there be a way to move forward with a building that has lain empty for two two years? I'm very mindful of things in the city, and I'll highlight Westburn House, you know, just sitting and becoming dilapidated and a complete and utter eyesore. I, th I think... <laughs> If I can maybe just intervene slightly, I think what Mr Forbes is trying to say is that the, the current design and use of materials um, it, it is not in the, the planning department's view um, to the standard or design quality that would have allowed them um, to, to deal with it in a more positive manner. And that I don't think he's saying there's no use for it at all. Um, but we have to deal with the application. We can't ask Mr. Forbes to say, well, if they added, you know, this onto it or that onto it. So I think what, what we're trying to, I think Mr. Forbes is trying to get to is that, you know, it's not that there wouldn't be a scheme that would be appropriate here. It's just that this one hasn't hit the, 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 the conditions or suitability of design that they feel that they can put forward for approval. Um, I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, Mr. Forbes, but I think yeah, you know, yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, sorry, sorry, yes, quite, quite right. I mean, uh, what I also I can just add, um, obviously, it's open to the applicant to come forward with a further application, um, addressing our concerns or or resubmit essentially. Um, but yeah, that that's that's you know that is still an option for them to come back with a further application. So it's not the case that the building would necessarily sit undeveloped. In fact, um, you know, we, we'd like to think that there is a design solution here. It's just you know, we have a duty to determine. That's essentially the position uh, we were at at the moment. Rather than we, we can't just continually defer an application just because we haven't reached agreement. Mr Lewis, I noticed your hands up. I'll just take him in, Councillor Stewart, in case he, he's got something to add to this particular point. Mr Lewis? Yeah, just just really just to add to what Robert said there. Um, obviously, the, the applicant would have a free shot, so they could, could come in with another application. We have been back to the applicant to ask for them to incorporate more granite into the building, um, but we haven't got agreement on that. So then we have a duty to determine the application that we have before us. And that's what we're doing now. So there is the option for the, the applicant to come back in with an amended proposal, and we're very open to that. Is that helpful, Councillor Stewart? Thank you. Yes, that's that clarifies it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, Councillor Cook. I was actually going to ask something in very, very similar vein to Councillor Stewart. Um, I just wondered, um, uh, Robert Ford made mention of a previous application, I think in um, 2018, I think he said. Uh, do we know what the reason for that refusal was? Sorry, I did thank try you, and find yes, it. Actually, thank you. Sorry, yes, there was actually two previous applications on the site, but neither of which have been refused. In fact, they were both withdrawn by the applicant. So we don't. We, this is the first time we've actually had a proposal before committee or a determination, in effect. So whilst there was previous the previous history, that it never actually resulted in a decision by the planning authority. So this is the first time there's actually been a decision on the application. Thanks. That's fine. And and I wasn't being lazy and not looking for it myself. 
Um, it was just my um, my internet's got a bit slow in the last couple of minutes. That's okay. Um, Councillor Ray Cormy. Thanks. Good to be there. Can I ask Mr. Forbes how much? Uh, obviously, the the frontage is not going to be reused with the granite. How much percentage of the of the existing granite is he going to be used at the in the in the side of the proposed building? Thank you. Um, we don't have a percentage, an exact figure in terms of the, the percentage as proposed, um, but you can see from the, the front of the, the proposed elevation that um, you, you've got roughly about in, in excess of half of the frontage would be proposed as granite, um, but it's it's not just the frontage, as I say, it's the side elevations as well. We're looking for enhanced usage on. So I'm afraid we don't have an, a percentage figure, but it's more obviously it's, it's more the um, the aesthetic impact of, of the building as a whole that we're looking at rather than uh, a rough percentage. There isn't actually a percentage figure that's required. It's it's more a, a judgment uh, on, on design grounds. Um, any other questions? Can I just ask Mr Forbes in terms of window to window, because there's obviously representations in terms of um, loss of light and immunity uh, to the adjacent grant gardens and ground uh, and grounds and flats Can you just again just reassure me that that um what the, the position was on that i was trying to find it but mine mine's locked as well on my other computer yes thanks again um sorry the, the window to window distance as i said from the rear of the site which is the uh, at the closest point it's roughly 20 meters uh between facing windows now the rear part of the site is roughly nine meters uh, from the, the rear window to the, the boundary of the site, the southern boundary. Then you've then got the garden ground of the, the properties on Craigie Street, so um, which is roughly about 11 metres deep. So the combined 9 and 11, that, that gets you around, around 20 metres window separation between the two buildings. Okay. And then on the front side of the site, obviously you're facing onto the street and the gap site of uh, where Richard works. Yeah, the land that they own currently. So that's currently doesn't have any buildings on it. And the tenement to the west is slightly offset and that's across a, a, a street at the moment. So the, this, there isn't the same concern about windows facing public road as there would be onto a private garden area. Okay. okay thank you, Mr Forbes. Okay, is there any other questions? I'm not seeing any more. Okay, the recommendation is what is anybody otherwise minded? Right, Councillor Cormie, are you indicating? I see you lighting up, but I don't know if you. Yeah, your hands up, Councillor Cormie. Yeah, no, I, 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 I would go for approval on this one. Okay. Um. Obviously, if there's a a move against um officer's recommendation, um, do you have a seconder? I'm not seeing any indications. No. Oh, Councillor Cook. Yeah, um, um, I, I'm I'm minded to go with the officer's recommendation, but um, for the purposes of allowing Councillor Cormie to explain his reasoning, a uh, uh, second formally. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, as part of our protocol, we will adjourn for um you to speak to officers to ensure that the uh, matters is. Uh, is properly addressed in terms of policy. So if uh, the necessary officers could take Councillor Cormie and Councillor Cook into a side room <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll come back in a moment. So, Ms. Convener, I'll just read out the wording as well for the recording if that's okay. So please yeah, note yeah. that Councillor Please note that Councillor Cormie has moved um, an amendment and in order to re review the appropriate wording with officers for his um, amendment, the meeting will be adjourned for a short period. Please note that the recording will continue. Therefore, this is a reminder to all participants to please switch off your microphones and camera during this, this adjournment. So Alan will now invite um, Councillor Cormie and Cook to a separate call. Thank you. Mr Lewis, I notice your hands up. Is there something you want to say? No, that's a legacy hand. Sorry. All right. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so if we adjourn um, for, let's say, take 10 minutes, and then if we need longer, we'll, we'll, we'll let you all know. So you can take a comfort break if you pop your mics off and your, <laughs> your cameras off. Thank you. Hello, Lindsay. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I can't see anything. So I think Alan Thompson will just try and dial you into a separate call just okay. now. Okay. Uh, okay. Just hold on. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Councillor Carmi. Hi, I'm in. I'm, a, I'm in. No, you're still in the main PDMC um, chat. Alan Thompson from Legal is going to phone you. So if you just accept the call that's coming through. I'm in the office, say, Gail. I'm in the office. Yeah, but he's going to dial you on the group chat. Okay. So when you get when you get a Teams call through from Alan Thompson, if you just accept. Where is that? Where do I find that, Gail? He's just about to ring you now. I'm just going to go oh, back I've, into that other call and call you. I broke my shoulder. That's the trouble.
Hello, can I anybody hear me? I can hear you, Bill, but you should be getting a call, aren't you? I haven't had it. Who's who's speaking? It's kind it's Councillor Bolton. Hi, Manny. I know I kind of. There's something ringing, but who do I click on? Press accept. There should be a thing saying to accept the call. I haven't got that. That hasn't came up. Um, I'm just I didn't to... come up, Manny. Uh, is, is there not, are you in the, have you got the chat up on the side? Uh, have, you, have you got your mobile phone there, uh, Bill? Mobile's here. I, I, I broke my bloody shoulder. This is a trouble. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, could you perhaps um, give yeah. um, Councillor Cormie's mobile number to Councillor, uh, to Mr Thompson? He can phone him in on that rather than trying to get them through Teams. I'm in the office. Yeah, I know, but he's not. Councillor, Councillor Cormie, can you tell me your mobile number? Sorry, or, oh, or send well. in a message. I'll send you a message, and if you give me your mobile number, or like, I was going to say I can look it up online, but have you got a council mobile? Aye, right, but I broke my shoulder, Lindsay. You'll have to get. Surely you've got my mobile number. Right, hold on, I'll just check. It's near ringing in here in the office. My phone number. Uh -huh. Well, she's going to call you on your mobile bill so that you can um, pick it up and just speak on the phone. Right. I've got both your number. Hold on. I'll ask Alan to call you that way. Hold on. Remember and put your um, Teams call on um, on mute, Bill. Otherwise, we'll all hear you. Oh, I've got it. Is that it now? No, you're still. I can still hear you. Put your mute on. Can you, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'll mute you. Hang on. Mute. I've muted you. Gail, I've just asked Alan to dial Councillor Cormie in because he's struggling. So I've just made. Yeah, uh, I'm not mute. I'm not, uh, <laughs> is that it now? <laughs> Bill, I muted you. You've unmuted yourself. Yeah. Uh, what I'll do, I'll add in other people's notes. Um, we come up here and I'm for you. Um, yeah. Robert Forbes, South East End. I think that's him in the call now. So I've muted <laughs> Councillor Cormie. He's in a call with Alan Thompson from yeah. Legal regarding the wording of his amendment. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Gail. Okay, members, that will probably be another five minutes, so uh, feel free to uh, get another cup of tea.
Gracias. Hello, members. Just um, we're just making sure we've got Councillor Cormy back. Am I back? Yes, you're back. <laughs> Good. Well, what, what time travels you, Bill? <laughs> I'm now leaving again. <laughs> Good. Okay, is Councillor Cook back? Yep, I'm here. Excellent. So, Alan, uh, Mr. Thompson, you're back. Yes, I'm here. Mr. Lewis. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, excellent. Okay, right. Um, we have an application before us. Um, I'll be moving the officer's recommendation, which is to refuse the application. Now, uh, I appreciate um, there's been a number of questions by members um, around uh, the use of a, an empty building, and I absolutely agree. We want to see our spaces used, but um, I'd also remind members that we have often given officers quite a hard time where we have not reused um, a suitable amounts of our, our the granite and they've been token used in wall little bits of walls etc so i think the fact that we renewed our technical note on um materials only in march um where we we, we gave a, a, an extra emphasis on the retention use of um granite that's taken down um i think we have to be then considerate of applications that come forward in that spirit. Now, again, in that technical note, we saw a lot of alternative uses that could be made of other types of um, materials, um, not just simply a render finish. And I think what we're trying to do is make sure that these buildings that hopefully will be there for many decades um, are reflective of high quality design. And I think what we're saying and what certainly what I, my reading into the application and determination by Mr Forbes is, is not that there's not a use for this site and it's not that, you know, the type of uh, residential um, properties on this site is, is not appropriate. It's making sure that the design and the use of materials is suitable. Um, and it's for those reasons that they've unfortunately had to refuse the application. Um, they have attempted to, to find um, a way forward, but unfortunately the application needed to be determined um, and, and that, that, if you like, agreement couldn't have been re re uh, reached to have a more positive um, approval. Um, what we, we saw, obviously there was two previous attempts at applications, but I would highlight that they were withdrawn by the applicant and hadn't been determined by officers. Uh, so for that reason, they, you know, we'd welcome obviously another application on this site, um, which maybe has a modifications that reflects maybe a, a more appropriate um, use of materials and design. And I'll leave it at that. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Greg. Thank you, convener. Um, I agree with all with all that you've said. Um, I think that Marbury Street has a uh, a varied and quite a rich vernacular look about it. It contains um, attractive variety of buildings. There's dressed granite, there's more rough hewn granite. Um, so th this building, this facade is part of the character of of the area. And the the question before us about this application is whether the, the look and the design adds to or detracts from the character of the area uh, and uh, I'm very much of the opinion that it would reduce the the quality of the visual um, enjoyment of of that area and particularly in in Mamberley Street. Um, I would imagine that there are alternatives open to the owner to retain the facade and adapt it in some way. It's quite a large it's quite a large facade with with undoubtedly various alternatives um, to retain as much of the granite as possible, and therefore to protect and preserve the character in a in a in a suitable way. Um, so I'm very much in support of of us doing what we can to ensure compliance with our with our policy on on granite. Um, I think that the proposal for render is not is not suitable. 
Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to support what you're proposing, convener. Thank you, Councillor Greg. Ca uh, Councillor Cormie, would you like to move your amendment? Thank you, uh, convener. I mean, I, I, um, I, I totally agree with uh, preserving as much granite as we can in our city uh, our heritage. It is very important. But knowing Mulberry Street, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably doing there, go through there once a week. Um, it's a mixture. You've got Broadford Works, you've got the Bastille, you've got um, little Tesco's. You, you've got a variation of, 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 of buildings all the way down there. Uh, this particular building is behind a, 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 a granite wall. And it, it, <laughs> you'd pass it and you, you'd never hardly see it because it's in a corner. Uh, many people wouldn't appreciate that the, the granite even stands there. But more importantly, what we're missing out here and is what is one bedroom uh, city centre living flats, which we really are desperate to, to have in our city centre. This is a brownfield site. It's not going anywhere. Nobody seems to be interested in it. This is an opportunity uh, to have one bedroom flats. It's not going to affect either Skeen Square or, or the grammar school uh, feed in uh, because there are no children come out of these one bedroom flats, obviously. Uh, and as I say, Convena, it really it frustrates me that we, you know, that, that we really are, are, are turning on 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 granite issues because we are so desperate in our city centre and in particular brownfield sites to have these uh, one bedroom affordable uh, uh, units um, for single uh, people or couples. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Convena. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cormie. Councillor Cook, you're seconding Councillor Cormie. Yes, thank you, Convener. I mean, just to say, I'm actually sympathetic with uh, to what Councillor Cormie has said. I was keen to hear a bit further his thoughts on those that he was beginning to touch on during the question session. Having said that, on balance, I agree with what you said. I agree with what um, uh, Councillor Greg said. If we can get this building reused while retaining the existing granite facade or at the, at, at the very worst reuse the granite great I know Mabry Street has got a mixture of facades but I think the fact that we've already lost some granite is not an ex, an, not a reason to lose some more granite so I'll be going with the officer recommendations okay thank you Councillor Cook uh, Councillor Stewart I've no <coughs> sorry I noticed your hands up uh, thank you, convener. It was just to say I, I tried to second you, but I just couldn't get my. Um, it's my connection, but the, it will be resolved. But yeah, so I was just to second you, but that's fine. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, I seem to be losing my voice. Some of you might be glad to hear. Um, is there anybody else wants to contribute to discussion, debate? No? OK, fine. Um, could I just then take Councillor Cormie in to, to sum up, please, Councillor Cormie? I've more or less said it all, convener. I mean, this is going to be a very difficult uh, building. Anybody that knows the building, you have passed it before you see it. Nobody knows, unless you're walking, you, you don't know it's there. And to get any developer to take that amount of granite on, uh, to convert it in particular uh, into uh, one bedroom flats, <laughs> it, 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 the whole thing is just not, it, it wouldn't be viable. And anybody's, you know, it's like black and white. And how how are you going to retain that amount of granite that's there, which is, you know, it, 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 it's a building, as I say, I don't know what it's been, it, it's, it's laying empty for years. Um, I don't know what it was previously uh, used for, but it certainly wasn't housing. Um, and, you know, to have this opportunity that somebody's going to take an interest in it, and we're going to lose so much granite, uh, a certain amount of granite, uh, nobody can tell us the percentage, um, but we're going to miss out in these uh, single uh, bedroom uh, units for the city centre living at an affordable price. So, you know, I've more or less said all I'm going to say, Convener, um, and it's just a pity that uh, we couldn't get some agreement uh, to get this thing on the go and, and, and get it converted into one bedroom flats. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cormie. You know, and, you know, I agree with elements of, of some of the things you said in terms of it, it's always good to be able to provide accommodation for anybody that requires it. But what I think we have to do is, is look at the legacy we're leaving. And that's where high quality design is essential. Um, and, you know, we, we, we had the opportunity if we weren't keen to pursue retaining the D5 policy of our granite heritage um, to, to take um, action, I suppose, when we were doing the technical note, but, you know, there was very much a drive from the committee and also, I think, from the wider public to retain as much as we can of our granite heritage. Now, I appreciate that reusing the, the, the granite is not always possible, but I think what we're seeing here is, you know, there could be a way forward, um, you know, but we have to deal with the application that's in front of us. And I think, you know, the way the officers have handled it and have tried to engage to get a more satisfactory um, design element to it, uh, uh, as well as reuse of granite. And we haven't quite got there yet. So I would rather, given that it will be there for an awful long time, whatever replaces it, what was I think a printing shop that we were told, um, it is the right building with the right design, with the right materials. Um, and that's why I'll be supporting the officer's recommendation of refusal on this page. But, you know, I would emphasize that we would welcome a, another application on this site, because like everyone, I think on the committee, what we want to do is promote positive, good design development. Um, and you're quite right, Councillor Cormier, you know, you know, the master plan and the city centre living is a key strategy that, the, you know, the council and this committee is, is absolutely committed to delivering. Again, it has to be the right project in the right place at the right quality. So I'll leave it at that and ask Ms McVean uh, to go to the vote, please. Thank you, convener. So the committee has before it a motion in the name of the convener to refuse the application and an amendment in the name of Councillor Cormie to approve the application. Can members please vote motion or amendment? Convener? Motion. Vice convener? Sorry, I can't hear properly. Sorry, Councillor Stewart, uh, the motion is to refuse the application or the amendment is to approve the application. Can you vote motion or amendment? Motion. Thank you. Councillor Allen? Motion. Councillor Cook? Motion. Councillor Radley? Motion. Councillor Cormie? Amendment. Councillor Gregg? Motion. Councillor McKenzie? Motion. Councillor Malik. Motion. The motion wins eight votes to one, so therefore the application is refused. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr McBain. Um, other reports on the agenda today. Um, uh, before I take it in, I just wanted to let off, um, members know, in case you hadn't been aware, I'm sure you will be, um, that obviously there was two appeals that uh, were recently overturned by the Scottish Government's reporter's office. One was for the Rubus Law Quarry development, which the, the committee obviously unanimously agreed to refuse. The other one was the one at Torrey on the Riverside. Again, it was a unanimous decision by the committee that was overturned by the reporter, and both of those have been approved. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the future. Um, so moving on to the other reports, 8.1, we have Aberdeen Planning Guidance on the Draft Lawson Development Framework. Um, I could hand up, is it Rebecca? Sorry. Yes, good morning, or actually it's good afternoon now, sorry, councillors. Um, the item, I'm going to try and share my screen um, initially. I have prepared um, a short presentation just to introduce um, the item on the agenda we have before us today. Everybody could just let me know that they can see it okay, and it's we can in, see the, it. Thank in you. the screen okay. Yeah, um, okay. Um, I might, um, I'm going to try and go through just a couple of the background issues um, to start off with um, and then we'll kind of dive into some of the more content of the report which is based around the consultation results. So item 8.1 today before us is um, the draft Lorston development framework um, the, which is going to be put forward and presented as Aberdeen planning guidance and this report outlines the consultation results. So initially, um, I'm just going to give a very brief background. You um, will probably be well aware of where the site fits in terms of um, its location in the city. 
Um, within the Aberdeen Local Development Plan, our currently adopted plan 2017, the Lorston site is um, located to the south of the city and the area covered by the development framework takes in um, a number of opportunity sites um, within, within this kind of zone. We have the majority um, contained within opportunity site 59 um, there's also OP60 to the south, which is Strategic Employment um, Reserve, and then also OP61 to the north, which is the Calder Park site, um, all within the, the land release, covered by the land release policy. Um, our, our proposed plan obviously alters um, this slightly, and OP61 has largely um, come out. Just to briefly give an overview um, for these are the key opportunity site, um, numbers. The site is in multiple ownership. Um, council being um, one of the interested parties for the future development of this site as well as landowner. You will be aware or you may be aware to date there has been a number of applications on the site primarily related to a planning permission in principle for development of a large proportion of the site. This is it's not very clear on the presentation I'm afraid but the red line boundary um, for the land kind of shown um, in it clearly in the middle, which has come forward for planning permission in principle. And following on from that, there has been a number of um, MSC applications to purify matter specified in condition. The primarily the purpose for the update of the framework. This was reported to a previous planning committee. It was, it was quite a while ago now, as we're talking back to 19th of September, uh, the end of last year. Um, this is where the draft framework was reported up and approved by members at this committee to go out for a period of public consultation. The previous version of the Lorston development framework was approved back in 2013 and this was adopted with the plan at that time. This then um, was subject to review by the Master Planning Consultants and the developers um, in, for, responsible for the site and production of the document. And this kind of slide just sums up kind of some of the evolving kind of context around the Lorston site um, that was taken into consideration in a review. Um, it, it, I wouldn't say it was a large scale re review of the entire framework. We primarily you will see um, on the next slides um, the same level of anticipated development. Um, but you'll know that there's um, changes around the kind of stadium site. We've obviously now seen development up at Calder Park, the Cove Rangers Football Club. Also, the new academy gone in and a couple of changes just mainly related to land ownership and boundaries around the business park. Um, a new development down to the south at Newton of Charleston um, as well. The next slide, uh, sorry, the next image picks up um, more to do with the future um, changes in spatial experience, potentially if um, the working of where the stadium was previously zoned. You can definitely see the, the, the spatially the connections between the new Charleston development at Cove connecting over um, Wellington Road into the new Lorston development. Um, the technical, technical, obviously the stadium will, will still remain within the Lorston development framework um, as an identified site um, as the document is required to comply with our adopted local development plan, which which has um, use as a community stadium. The next two images um, will show um, basically the the fr the development framework. This is the kind of key key diagram that we would use as a planning service as our strategic planning guidance for the site shows how the site will be divided up into various development blocks. Um, it shows the, the key access points um, into the surrounding area, as well as key infrastructure, um, routes through the site, roads, um, open spaces, and the protections and buffer zones situated around the block. Um, and the next image just gives you an idea of um, how it's intended the site to be developed in terms of density um, and also uses. So the reds and oranges being higher density as you move further back um, into the site um, goes lower. Employment uses and um, local commercial retail potential to the, to the south immediately along Wellington Road. Um, and then the, the kind of hub of more community focused um, schooling and academy community facilities towards the north. Um, just picking up here on 
the access and um, connectivity for the site. Um, primarily, the site has um, seen strategic points for vehicular access to along Wellington Road, a secondary one to the back of Wellington Circle, and then a sustainable travel route um, routing further north up, up towards Red Moss Road as a potential. Uh, the phasing, as, as you can see, over a number of years, the site, the intention is that it will start at the first southerly access point junction off Wellington Road, move into the site and then start to wrap around um, the lock before moving back and then further north into the upper parts of the site. So further back to the purpose of um, the day is to report back on the public consultation that we, we ran on the draft framework. This was advertised and it ran for four weeks back in November um, to December of 2019. It does seem like a very long time ago. Um, as a result, we received um, nine responses which came into this consultation. Um, primarily, these were from organisations, um, you know, the usual ones such as Scottish Water, um, etc as well as um, some planning consultancies which were acting on behalf of local um, landowners and also developers within the area. This is a very brief summary just in the presentation, the report, um, the sections um, 3.14 to 3.19 within the report will give much more detail in terms of the issues, but primarily the comments which um, came in related to the interested landowners and developers expressing a um, uh, lack of engagement that was um, achieved, was given to them on the updated version of the framework. Um, there are a couple of discrepancies in the road pattern illustrated across different plans within the framework. There were questions around the deliverability of access arrangements um, to ensure um, consistency with the approvals, the planning commission principal approval, as well as conditions to ensure the development of the whole of the allocation site alterations um, affecting um, phasing of the land to the north of Red Moss Road, replacement housing units um, as the, the primary school site within the framework has been relocated um, and reiterating from a couple of consultees the importance of the uh, Lorston Lock, the buffers um, for protected species. And just moving on to it's kind of as we go along the time timeline, uh, upon a review, which would have been back at the start of this year, um, a review of the comments which were submitted, um, we did feel that an additional engagement exercise was required between the master planning consultants um, responsible for producing the document and with the interested landowners and developers, um, which we, we recommended was undertaken before we reported back to committee. This was communicated to committee a service update at the March um, committee this year. And the master planning consultants have undertaken this additional um, engagement exercise over the summer months of this year. Um, it has been it has taken slightly longer due to, to circumstances, um, but they've undertaken the additional engagement um, and as a result, resolved the issues that were raised in in some of the con in some of the consultation feedback which we received. The, these were kind of two phases um, that we're now reporting back on in terms of consultation, the public consultation and also this um, additional landowner endorsement of the document, which happened later, which has resulted in several actions and amendments to the framework, um, which is now um, on what is called revision D, um, which is attached to the committee papers. Uh, a full list of actions you'll see and also the recommended amendments um, the officers have recommended is contained in Appendix 2. And the like a very brief summary of the kind of things which have um, changed within the document. There have been some drawing errors, um, some of those discrepancies layouts have been updated, um, as well as um, land ownership and phasing to do with the affected land to the north of Red Moss Road. Um, arrangements um, and connections along Red Moss Road. Some of those have required additional clarification. There's been more advice um, on ecological species data sources. Um, just over time, some of some of these um, some of this information has changed, which requires it to be updated in in the, in the new framework. 
um, the importance of partnership working to ensure deliverability, um, deliverability of the entire allocation and to ensure that the, the different landowners and developers um, effectively work, work well together. And there have been a couple of um, more minor, um, just textual changes, um, factual document references as, um, as things have changed over the course of time. So that I think is the end um, and I welcome any questions. I'll just stop sharing my screen and then we can get everybody back up. Um, any questions that members may have? Okay, thanks very much, uh, Ms. Ms. Kerr. Uh, that was obviously it's quite quite a meaty document and just trying to, to, to get comparisons of what was before and where we are now it, it was quite interesting so um I'll, before i ask some questions i'll take kind of take notice of your hand up. Yeah. Um, so sorry um I, I didn't catch that um i'm just bringing in councillor gray yep yes thank you convener um i, I agree this is a really impressive document um the the summary of responses at the end is is very lengthy and i think that that shows that the that the en engagement with the community with the public has been very meaningful because we can see that there has been various times where points raised have been confirmed there's been amendments made to to the draft um, for example, um, on housing numbers, there's, there are queries about housing numbers, about transport access and, and many other things. So it's been a really valuable and, and well executed consultation. And therefore, um, I, I wanted to know if there will be ongoing engagement with the, with the, with the community, um, because that might help to make, to make sure that the document is, is, is relevant and can reflect some of these really useful and and um, positive suggestions um, that have been raised. Yep, certainly. Um, thank you, Councillor Greg. Um, the as the kind of development and as Lorston um, develops over time, there will be the requirement set out from the framework for a series of phased master plans as well, which will come in as part of the planning app application process. Um, there will be more um, detailed planning applications. And again, there will be other matter specifying conditions applications. Um, it just depends on you know which kind of process um, the community would get involved mainly depends on which part of the site's being developed. Not all of the allocation is covered by the existing planning permission and principle. So there, there may be, you know, the, the need to feed into to a couple of those processes. Alongside that, this document will um, is before you today for endorsement and approval as Aberdeen planning guidance, which will sit alongside um, the local development plan. So Understandably, as that local development plan takes this document forward, there will be the potential to review and engage further on this document um, alongside that process as well. That's great. Thank you very much. It is a very substantial project, and I would presume that given the potential um, demands that the process raise, the demands on on officer time, that you'll be doing this in in more or less bite size um, sections. Um, just in order to ensure that you're comprehensively dealing with everywhere um, and in detail. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no thank you, Councillor Greg. Councillor Radley. Hi there, thank you. Um, the, I, I agree that the document is very comprehensive. The only area of concern that I sort of found is that Red Moss Road continues to be identified as an access point. Um, you know, at the minute it is part of the Safe Routes to School um, zone um, and it is a single single lane carriageway um, that has no footpath and would be unsuitable for um, ve vehicle access at the time at this time um, there's also concerns about the Red Moss Road to West Tullis Junction and sort of the increase in traffic that comes as a result of maintaining this as, a, as an access road um, can you give me sort of a bit of understanding about that why that's been continued as a as an access route. Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor Radley. So I've just realised I didn't think that my camera was on. So I've just <laughs> just so I can put my, my face to the voice for you all as well. 
stopped sharing my screen and then didn't didn't turn it off. Um, yes, you'll you'll note in the document quite rightly that the route um, further towards the north, um, which um, is been it's Red Moss Road, it's the existing Red Moss Road. And this is identified as a kind of in the strategic development framework, it's identified as a, a kind of active and sustainable travel route. So the intention behind this route would be to to ensure that connections to the north are possible, but it would be restricted to bus, um, pedestrian and cycle routes only. Um, this is a kind of extension as it, as it is now. This road is just now. It is restricted in terms of the movement. And this kind of just is the next layer on top of that um, to show that that route would always, as a through route, be restricted to the types of traffic that could use it. Um, totally un appreciate that the, the road just now in its current condition and the, you know, the design of the carriageway, et cetera, would not, you know, you couldn't imagine seeing a bus trundling along there tomorrow. Um, but the if the development is deemed to require this bus route, um, then this this will require to be upgraded to full adoptable road standards. Um, the the important point, I guess, the distinction between the layering, you know, this is a this is a meaty document. This is the framework document, and we will have much more kind of layers of detailed proposals that fall out of this framework. Um, there will be a detailed master plan as well as planning applications, which will flesh out exactly how that northern portion of the site will be developed. Um, and in terms of how they take um, that route forward in terms of a bus route, the the intention within the framework is to show that 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 opportunity is there to have that sustainable connection through. Um, and it also ensures that all the development blocks and all the new homes which are um, which are put in place at Lorston have um, a, a, an easy access to a 400 metre walking distance to, to a bus stop to ensure that they get um, access to public transport. Um, so that's that's the key the key thing that we need to make sure there's a route that can go through Lorston to the new development to make sure everybody can get adequate public transport. Um, the point about the the obviously since the initial framework was kind of envisaged back in 2013, um, things have changed um, towards the back of the Lockside Academy site. There have been changes to um, some of the um, accesses and rights over um, Red Moss Road as a result of a condition to the consent for Calder, Calder Park to the Academy. There was a partial pedestrianisation put in place um, along um, a portion of Red Moss Road. Um, and this is gated um, um, at both ends and it, and it restricts traffic, it's pedestrianised and it also allows for that safe route to school. Um, any developer or any development um, planned um, application that comes in would then require a new application to, to alter that arrangement. Um, so that is pedestrianised now and any alteration to that would require a separate planning application. Um, so we do feel that the, the framework kind of offers that strategic opportunity for a connection for a sustainable active travel route. However, there is flexibility within that um, with the master plans and the applications that would come later um, as, a, as a future phased approach that, that could alter that arrangement. Um, and, and all those layers and procedures that come in place should, will, will also give the community uh, a lot more opportunities to comment on the detailed design as well. Um. Thank you for that. Um, just as sort of a follow up, if that's OK, Camina. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, certainly. Yes, certainly. Uh, would there ever be, uh, just sort of seeking assurances, would there ever be um, the opportunity for that route to become a through route for general vehicle traffic, traffic or will it be maintained as an active travel route? Yep, there, there's there's no intention presented in the in the framework um, for for that route to be opened up. Um, it's always shown um, as being stopped up at some point. At the moment, the stopping up is is kind of related to where that pedestrianisation has been put in place at the back of the school. In the the framework, it anticipates that the stopping up of Red Moss Road would move slightly um, westwards, and it would be it would connect up with where the the main primary street would end effectively. Um, I mean, I could try and get a picture up to um, identify exactly where if you wanted you know, to look on the plan. Um, but effectively, there would be no through route for, for cars along Red Moss Road that's presented in the framework. If anybody wanted to, to change that arrangement, they would have to apply for a new application um, and that would be assessed um, as part of that. Application. Thank you.
Thanks so much. Um, other questions for Ms. Kerr? I've got, I've got a few. Um, mm -hmm. Could you maybe explain, obviously we've got the phasing and we're starting furthest, if you like, away from where the school is. Can, can we understand the kind of the logic behind the phasing? Yeah, the, the phasing was to coincide with the the access jun junction that was, would be going in. Um, the one um, that they've got consent for just now is the one to the south. Um, so that already has consent um, and it allows to go in to unlock some of those initial development blocks. Um, they progressed with that one over and above the one to the north simply because that one was more associated with the stadium site. So um, it was it was left um, and the, the phasing would always was always envisaged to come come in at the south and wrap around the, the lock site slowly as it moved northwards. Can I, I ask as well, obviously we, we've got phasing, but we've obviously got multiple landowners. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of if you've got one landowner who is perhaps eager to progress and you know, has a um, very valid <laughs> reason to, to try and move their, themselves up the ladder, if you like, um, is there a facility to allow that to happen? And is, is there any land that is being potentially like landlocked in terms of not being able to become if another hasn't been started? Yeah, um, I'll maybe just share, share the screen again, just so I can point to the, to the, to the plan for this one. Um, yes, there is a condition on the planning permission in principle, which requires delivery um, of a connection um, which is onto the existing Red Moss Road um, further north. And this is kind of identified, sorry, the, the numbers aren't very clear, but it's this little pink bubble there, um, which is the number three. Um, and this is um, delivery, um, I can't remember the exact number of units, but it's by completion of a certain number of units. It may be like three or 400 units. Um, and once the that um, link is in place, that then unlocks those kind of those further back parcels um, and sits with the phasing, which has been established within the planning permission in principle. Um, so that you know that condition is there to ensure that the, that that doesn't happen, that we don't end up with with one parcel that's developed and another bit can't be. Um, and it's and it's envisaged at that at that point there, which is you know associated where, with where the split of the land ownership lies as well. Okay. Um, we obviously we've got planning in principle for. Um, Traveller's site. Now that hasn't obviously been progressed yet. In terms of any of these changes um, that we, we've made, um, does that assist or none of it's uh, detrimental to its delivery, is it? it? No, it doesn't affect it. The the site's just up here. Um, um, there were, when the framework was presented um, to committee back in 2013, at that point, there were, I think there were maybe four or five options for where the Gypsy Traffic site could be accommodated. Since then, obviously, applications for consent have come in and we have an approval. Um, so that's yeah. just, it, it's kind of considered as a fixed within the framework um, because it has consent um, and, it, and, it, and it wouldn't, the changes wouldn't preclu preclude any of that, um, that going forward. Um, the main change in terms of the split of facilities um, was, was just to move the primary school site from further up here down to within block E9. Um, and that, you know, logically we can see how that makes sense in terms of co-location with the academy and the sharing facilities um, for kind of modern community campus style um, um, facilities. That's fine. Um, and of course, one of the biggest criticisms we always get from, from the community, understandably, is that, you know, we have these frameworks and master plans and often they deviate and people will say they don't resemble what we started with. But I think it's back to the big uh, comment where, you know, it, it's about that continual engagement as we, as the master plan and framework develop. Um, and, and I suppose it's just an observation that I think we have continued to develop this in, in line with the community, the community council, and other statutory consultees. So again, it's just to you know reinforce that if there was to be any changes for whatever reason, that then we need to make sure that we're uh, taking the community with us and that they can still recognise in its um, original form to a certain degree uh, the, the framework that we set out to achieve. Um, has anybody got any more questions? Yep. Okay, well, 
firstly, as I say, let me thank you very much, um, Ms. Kerr, for, for the report because you know I can't undersell how much work goes into these things and, and the fact that I think it was really important that when there was a concern by the developers and landowners that they hadn't maybe been fully engaged with, that we went back to insured and you know, and that's been through a difficult time with COVID and everything else, but we've continued to to, to move forward. And, you know, that's credit to, to you and, and the rest of the team that I know that a, a massive working to, to, to getting us to this report today. So, you know, do accept our, our appreciations as a committee. Committee, we add recommendations are item two. At 2.1, it asks that the committee approve the responses proposed by officers to those consultation responses received on the law development framework as approved for public consultation by the Planning Development Management Committee on 19 September 2019, Appendix 2, and at 2.2, approve the content of the Lawrence Development Framework 2020, Appendix 1, as applicable planning guidance on statutory planning guidance. So can we agree? Yeah, I don't see any hands saying otherwise. Okay, thanks, you, committee. Right, just about there is all to say is we've got the next date of the planning meeting is, believe it or not, 21st of January 2021. Um, as I said at the start of the meeting, this is the last planning meeting uh, for this year. We have some LRBs, but, you know, the formal planning uh, meeting. So I'd just like to thank you all for your commitment over the last 12 months. Uh, much of it has been quite challenging with COVID. But I think the, the planning committee should be very proud that we continued through all of it. And I'd like to thank officers for their massive support in making this happen. Mrs. BT, your team has been a credit to you. And, you know, even with these technical hiccups that we've had at time to time, it hasn't deterred us. I'd like to thank the, the legal team who have also joined us. Um, you know, Scott, the, the Rhodes team have been amazing too. So just all in all, I think that the teamwork that's got us to where we are, you know, at the end of the year, Having battled through COVID, you know, I, I would just like to thank you on behalf of all the members of the committee for, for your support in getting us to where we are. And I'd just like to wish you all a well-earned break at Christmas. Um, and, and I know that Mrs. Beattie, that you've not just got planning um, to deal